28. Lily stepped inside. The warmth enveloped her, wrapping her up like a blanket after the bitter cold of her ride. Her hands ached inside her leather gloves. The hallway of 702 March Place looked as it always did, from the rust-hued wallpaper to the worn oriental carpet on the floor. The space smelled of boiled greens and suet, Mrs. Bramble's infamous nettle pudding. But something was off. The sad pilchards still glistened in the horrid still life on the wall, next to the stuffed kittens frozen into their scene of cosy domestic bliss. Yet in the air was something other than the scent of steamed nettles, an energy of tension that radiated down the stairs. Estelle's door was open. There was nothing unusual in that, but there was in the low voices that drifted to where Lily stood, their murmuring quick and agitated. The mat under her feet was soaked, marked with still melting bits of snow. Mrs. Bramble should be there, scolding her about neglecting to clean her boots. The house felt as though it were waiting, hushed and uncomfortable. She climbed the stairs. They were silent under her boots, no creak singing out her arrival as she reached the open door and looked into Estelle's flat. The signs were subtle, easy to overlook. The room appeared as it always did, save for the full glass of vermouth sitting on the table. The dreadful Chinese urn was toppled from its stand onto the rug. The dog-shaped lid had come off and cracked in two. No ancient emperor's ashes lay inside, just a cobweb and the delicate remains of a moth. Lily didn't call. She walked inside, heart pounding against her ribs, and followed the sound of the voices through the drawing room and down the hallway to Estelle's bedroom. Are you sure she isn't still out? The lecture should have ended two hours ago, Miss Bard replied. Even with the storm, she should have been home by now. Perhaps she met a beau, went out for a drink, Mrs. Bramble countered. Or she might have run off with the gasworks man. Honestly, Agatha. Lily stepped up to the door. Miss Bard and Mrs. Bramble turned to look at her. Miss Bard's face was pale making her eyes look wide and dark like some frightened animal. What's going on? Lily asked. Before they could answer, her gaze fell on the mirror behind them, the glass over Estelle's vanity table. It was cracked, a spiderweb of fractures radiating out from a point of impact. The images of the vision played out, vivid and clear as a set of photographs. Estelle at her glass, the shadow behind her, moving from the open door of the closet, the glint of silver in its hand, a weapon thin and sharp as Arabia. No, she realized, not Arabia. The dream had been imperfect, as they always were, her mind filling in for the unfamiliar, the things it lacked the experience to grasp. The dog split in two on the floor in a pile of ashes, it was how she had interpreted the breaking of a Chinese urn she had never seen before. The shadow stood in for the form and face of a man she hadn't met. She could fill them in now, knew who it was that had made his way into the house, probably hours before, when the comings and goings of the inhabitants would have masked the sound of one more door opening. Who waited, concealed inside Estelle's closet, until she was there, alone, at her table. You have her? Those were Hartwell's words into the telephone an hour before. He hadn't been discussing the transfer of another poor prostitute unlucky enough to fall into his care. It had been Waddington, reporting the success of his mission to retrieve Estelle. That silver weapon in his hand? It was a needle. What did you inject her with? He had come for her, driving the needle into her arm, drugging her with some sort of sedative. She had fought him, the mirror breaking during their struggle. Lily could imagine it, 
fill in the spaces the vision had left empty or jumbled with symbols. How he must have dragged her into the drawing room, Estelle reaching out weakly, just managing to strike the urn off its pedestal as they passed. And then? She recalled the rest of what she had foreseen. An unfamiliar space, shadows shifting in the flickering of a single flame against a backdrop of walls of dark glass. They resolved themselves now, took a firmer form as she melded them to Hartwell's words over the telephone. Yes, the warehouse will do. It was one of the hundreds of warehouses that crowded the city's wharves. That's where he had taken her, where he would prepare her for the next phase of Hartwell's experiment. Draining the blood into bottles, stealing it from victims while they slept, hadn't worked. He would try something different this time. A new protocol. Something that required not just the blood to be stolen, but the woman herself. A procedure that would see Estelle's blood taken from her veins and poured directly into Joseph Waddington. A change Hartwell hoped would make the transfer of her power permanent. Lily could see her as vividly as if she were in the room. Estelle, sitting up, pale as a ghost, the blood seeping through the hand clasped to her throat, her eyes wide and vacant. Thief. Murderer. Aluka. Aluka. Blood drinker. The full horror of the truth settled in. They had been watching her. Hartwell had set his men to follow her after she had provoked him in the gallery. She had noticed them outside the house, dismissed them as a case of paranoia. One of them must have seen the guests streaming in and out through the door and become curious. All it would have taken was a casual question, and he would learn that a medium lived here. That's how Waddington had known where to find her. Estelle didn't advertise her services. Lily thought that would keep her safe. Meanwhile, she had led a killer directly to her front door. She remembered Estelle's story the morning after the seance, after Lily had let Waddington inside the house, of a client at the seance she believed was a competitor, a man who could see the dead. It was Waddington, using a power he had stolen from Annalise Boyden, his grasp on it fading as he searched for a new victim. It was her fault. Lily had made this happen, brought all of it about through her foolish attempts to change what was to come. Just like she had before. The horror of it hit like a blow, roaring in her ears, pushing her back from the doorway. You all right? You've gone over a bit queer. Mrs. Bramble noted, frowning at Lily. Miss Bard looked over as though just noticing she was there. Do you know what this is? She demanded. Do you know what's happened to her? She stepped forward as Lily backed away. I'm sorry, she stammered. I'm not well. She ran, bolting down the stairs, tearing open the door. She staggered out into the street, the cold snapping at her, snow-covered stones slipping under her feet. She fell, tumbling to her knees in the middle of the road, the rows of respectable brick houses standing stoically back to observe through their darkened windows. She was alone. No carriage tracks or hoof prints desecrated the unbroken perfection of the snow. Even her own trail quickly swallowed up in the thick, hushed fall of it. The cold seeped up through her trousers, sinking into her bones. Estelle was going to die. And she had made it happen. Just like she did fourteen years ago. The world shifted to another night on another street, one far less respectable than March Place. A Covent Garden alley, papered with fading playbills, stinking of stale beer and urine, 
The sound of drunken laughter rang in the distance alongside the hoarse calls of prostitutes. She had agreed not to wear red, to leave her jewels at home, not to go alone. She had done it, kept all the promises Lily had wheedled from her, begged and cried for her to adhere to. Lily's intercession had led directly to her mother lying on the ground, blood spilling from the stab wounds in her chest, turning an ivory gown to crimson. Paste jewels sparkled, scattered across the paving stones. A dead man lay beside her, another casualty of Lily's attempt to thwart what some greater force had already ordained. Her fault. All her fault. In the emptiness of March Place, the snow melted to ice against her knees, dusting her back, the storm whirling around her with the ferocity of a wild animal. It would always be like this. She would be battered with knowledge that meant nothing. Any action she took would rebound back upon her, destroying the lives of the people she loved most. There could be no purpose in that, no hope, just an unending torment of grief and powerlessness. Despair rose up, choking her as she stood in a vortex of spinning snow. She had failed. She was always going to fail. The full implication of that knowledge came at her like a shadow rushing out of darkness. She held her breath, braced for it, for accepting everything it would mean. The wind changed. It fell back. Instead of twisting and consuming her, the snow hung suspended in the air. The world went quiet the thick and pregnant silence of a room full of people anticipating some great announcement. The snow-covered ground beneath her wasn't a respectable city street any longer. It had become something else. A crossroads, with the darkness of the unknown waiting at either end of it. There was still a choice. She could acknowledge that her power was the embodiment of futility and go back to desperately ignoring it, abandoning any hope of something more, of a purpose. Or, she remembered Hartwell's voice, the words ghosting into the black receiver of the telephone. I'll be there at dawn. It wasn't dawn yet. It was next to hopeless, a gamble with almost no chance of success. There had to be nearly a thousand warehouses in this labyrinth of a city, and Lily had no logical way of narrowing her search to discover which one Estelle was being held in. She would be giving up her chance to flee. Hartwell would already be positioning his forces, preparing to exercise the control he knew he had gained over her. Any hope of gathering what scraps of her life she could and running would be gone. But she could still choose to fight. She thought of the refuge's attic, of the figure from Evangeline Asher's painting, a goddess out of myth, a force to be reckoned with. She hesitated. Against all her own logic, she knew she was looking for a sign, for something like Robert Asher's Parliament of Stars to tell her which way to go. The wind turned again. The ebb of the storm had passed, and it redoubled in intensity, blowing into a howl. Ice battered at her cheek, stinging in its ferocity. She stood, her bones aching, muscles battered. There was one weapon she still possessed, one course that presented her best hope of turning this slimmest of chances into something real. The idea of using it filled her with fear. She would do it anyway, but not alone. 29. 
the Triumph skidded to a stop, tires sliding across the snow-covered Bayswater street. She shifted her weight, fighting for balance, barely saving herself from wiping out. Lily had been taking the road slower than her racing heart would have liked, but it didn't matter. The storm was thick enough now that the motorcycle was a liability. She would need other means of transportation for the rest of the evening. She killed the engine, pulled off her goggles, and looked up at Strangford's front steps. They were covered in an unblemished blanket of white. A little cone of snow rested on the head of the iron pug. The flakes continued to drift down around her, glittering in the glow of the gaslight. At the end of the road, the park was a wilderness unmarked by so much as a single hoofprint. It was past midnight. The windows of the fine houses lining the road reflected the storm like dark mirrors. Everyone in this respectable quarter of the city was certainly asleep. It would be hours yet before even the cooks and chambermaids rose from their beds. It was an abysmally poor time for a call. She looked up at Strangford's dark windows and felt a quick jolt of fear. The thought of being turned away cut as surely as the cold in the air. No, she admitted. This door would open for her, no matter how inappropriate the hour. She knew that with a bone-deep certainty. She set the triumph against the iron rails of the fence and jogged up the steps. There was only a moment of hesitation before she grasped the brass knocker and rapped it, loudly and repeatedly, a demand no one could mistake for anything else. Then she waited. There was no answer. The trepidation crept back. She forcefully ignored it, took the knocker, and swung it again. Rap, 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 rap. The door flew open. Strangford's country footman, Roderick, stood there, his livery jacket buttoned askew over his nightshirt. He blinked out at her blearily, holding a lamp in his hand. Then his eyes cleared enough for him to recognize who was standing on the step. Is Lord Strangford in? I promise you that it's terribly urgent, Lily announced. The boy's gaze moved quickly from her trousers to the snow dusting her hair, stopping at her face. He stepped aside, opening the door wider to invite her in. I'll wake him, he said. He's awake. Strangford's voice floated down from the top of the stairs where he stood wrapped in a grey dressing gown. His hair was mussed looking longer and wilder than usual as a result. Lily's mind flew back to the vision of his hand on her shoulder, his lips moving to her neck, setting fire to her skin. By coming here like this, imposing on him in the middle of the night, she was claiming an intimacy she could not take back. It opened the door to a future she had tried desperately to avoid, with all the heartbreak it surely promised. It didn't matter. She was done running from it. The truth of what he was to her was undeniable now. I need you, she said. The words came easier than she had thought they would. He didn't question, answering without taking his dark eyes from the place where she stood. Roderick, show Miss Albright to the study. Put some coal on the fire. I'll be down in a moment. This way, miss. Roderick clung to some semblance of his footman's habit as he gestured her down the hallway. He led her to the study, turning on a pair of electric lamps. They cast a warm, even glow over the room. The fire had died to red embers in the hearth. Roderick crouched before it, adding a few scoops of fuel. One lump jumped back rolling past him across the carpet. He caught it, tossing it back in and then brushing off his hands. Can I get you anything, miss? He asked as he rose. Tea or... something. That won't be necessary, Lily replied. Thank you, Roderick. 
he gave a quick bow and showed himself out, leaving Lily alone in the quiet sanctuary of Strangford's study. Her pulse continued to race. It had been pounding since she left March Place, every fibre of her screaming for action, movement. She had chosen a path and it brought her here, where for a moment there was nothing to do but wait. She had been here before, but then her impression of the space had been limited to quick surprise at the bright and furious panoply of the paintings that adorned the walls. Works that would not be at all considered proper for the home of a respectable member of the Tun. Any temptation to give them greater attention had been blown away in the immediacy of Strangford's obvious distress. They were universally startling, executed in vivid colours and bold primitive lines, like the crayon strokes of a joyful child. There were forests of white trees woven through with dancing figures in exotic gowns. The haunted gaze of a beautiful but hollow-cheeked woman holding a tawny cat in her lap. Elsewhere, a pair of skulls cloaked in brightly patterned robes moved together as though for a kiss. Other canvases exploded with light and colour, representing no natural view she had ever seen. Every piece was unique, united only by an energy and intensity that made them feel more alive than any expert mimicking of the forms and hues of the real world. She moved closer, drinking them in. What do you think? Strangford asked. He stood in the doorway. He had quickly dressed in his usual plain black suit, but had foregone a tie. His hair remained untamed. They are wonderful, Lily said. He stepped into the room. I don't show it very often, he admitted. You selected each of them personally. I chose everything here. Even the inkwell, she asked, trying to break the tension she could feel mounting inside of her at the sight of him surrounded by this art, at the whispering notion of what the gallery revealed about the curator that something wild lived beneath that quiet exterior, something so passionately full of life it might hurt you to look at it. He moved to the desk, running a gloved finger along the dent in the pewter. The inkwell belonged to William Blake. It was an excessive indulgence. But his mind is such a remarkable place to share, even in echo. He dropped his hand, turning serious. What's happened? The moment of peace, of letting herself forget why she was there, passed. Lily felt the weight of her intent settle back onto her. What I've been trying to stop, she said. Estelle? He's taken her. Her voice hitched on the words. Who? Strangford demanded. Hartwell. She felt a moment of fear part of her waiting for Strangford to push back, to demand evidence or argue that a man like Dr. Joseph Hartwell couldn't possibly do such a thing. Instead, he headed for the door. Let's go. He believed her, without question. The impact of that shook her. Where? she demanded. There's a police kiosk at Paddington Station. We can't go to the police. She cut back quickly. The knowledge that her description could well have been circulated to the station scattered about the city came home to her again. Even if we could convince them to act against one of the most prestigious men in Britain, on our word, they'd find nothing at his home. She isn't there. Then where is she? That is what I came here to find out. You have something for me? He asked. The assumption came so easily that she had woken him in the night simply to make use of his hands again. She felt a stab of shame that her treatment of him justified it. No, she countered. I have something for myself. His dark eyes were intent, focused on her entirely. You mean to use your gift? I don't think you'll approve of the method, 
she met his gaze. And the method is? She took the little blue bottle containing the wine of Jerima from her pocket and handed it to him. He studied the label. Mr. Ash said it would act as a shortcut to unlocking greater potential in my... ability, she finished awkwardly. He gave you this? No, Lily returned. He did not. She read the disapproval in his look. You should have gone to him, not come here, he said. You know he would help with anything you asked. I don't want Ash for this, she pushed back. I need someone I trust. Trust. The word hung in the air between them, heavy with significance. Emotion strangled her, stripping her voice raw. I have treated you abominably, she said, the words carrying the weight of a confession. And I would understand if you turned me out. I would never do that, he replied quietly. She felt both the pain and the relief of that wash over her. He returned his gaze to the wine of Jrima. Do you know how it works? No, she admitted. Have you any idea how much you can safely take? I'll work it out. He was tense. She could read the disapproval in every line of his body. He held the bottle up. This could be poison, he pointed out. Hartwell will tie her to a table and drain the blood from her body, she retorted, feeling brittle. There is no one else, no one, who can get to her in time. I will not stand here and debate. I am doing this. Will you stay with me? Yes, he replied. At the sound of that single syllable, yes, falling into the stillness of the room, some last shred of resistance inside of her shattered. There had never been someone she could depend upon, not her mother, certainly not her father. Yet here stood a man who offered her what she asked of him without question or condition. There was no time to contemplate what it meant or to react against the terrifying vulnerability it entailed. She needed to act. She scanned the room, her eyes stopping on the deep green chairs by the fire. No, not there. Strangford cut in, reading her intent. He shrugged out of his coat, folding it into a neat bundle and setting it down in the centre of the rug. Here, he ordered. On the floor, she asked, surprised. Neither of us has any idea what the contents of that bottle will do to you, and one cannot fall off of the floor. She considered it for a moment, then acknowledged the wisdom of the suggestion. She sat down. There are a few rules I must insist upon before you proceed, he continued. Name them, she said. It felt odd to speak up at him from the ground. First, I must have your consent to physically restrain you should it prove necessary. The notion was unsettling, a potential implication she had not considered. Yes, Lily uncomfortably agreed. Of course. Second, if at any point in these proceedings I detect a serious threat to your own well-being, you agree that I may call for assistance. I am to be given complete discretion on that point. She had sidestepped Strangford's concern about the contents of the bottle, but this concession brought it firmly back. She had no idea what the substance inside it was or what it would do to her. He was right, of course. She should have gone to the refuge and begged Ash to assist her. But... If Ash's assertion about the powers of the wine of Jerima was correct, she was about to blast the doors off of a part of herself she had fought desperately for most of her life to shut out. She had not been lying when she told Strangford why she came here instead of Bedford Square. She needed him far more than she needed to know the proper way to do what she was about to do. 
You have my permission to take whatever action you deem necessary, she replied. There was a pause the length of a breath as he stood over her in his shirt sleeves. I don't like this, Lily. I am done waiting in the wings while the people I love are taken from me. The words shook with more grief than she would have cared to admit. If there's something inside me that stands even a chance of saving them, and this helps me find it, then it is worth it, whatever the risk. He pulled the stopper from the bottle and offered it to her. It passed from his gloved hand to hers, their fingers brushing. The scent of it was woody, honeyed and acrid, both alluring and terrible. She contemplated the level of liquid inside. It was filled to the brim. How much should she take? A few drops, perhaps? Then wait for some effect, carefully assessing whether it were having any ill impact on her body? She looked to the clock on Strangford's desk. It was one thirty. There was no time. She put the bottle to her lips, tipped back her head, and drained it. The taste was terrible, like off wine soaked in sawdust. Damn it, you might have started slow, he seethed from above her. In for a penny, she returned thinly. She laid back on the ground, resting her head on Strangford's folded coat. The rug was soft, and the fire had flared up in the hearth, wrapping her in warmth. She was far less uncomfortable than she had thought she would be. Strangford paced. The clock ticked. Tell me how you're feeling, he ordered. Perfectly, entirely, the next word was to have been ordinary. It failed to leave her lips, as she was distracted by the realization that the room had become brighter. Had Strangford turned up the lamp? No. It was something more than that. The colours themselves had changed, becoming vivid, more saturated. The green upholstery of the chairs glowed, the pale grey wallpaper shimmering like the inside of an oyster shell. It was as though the room was turning into one of the paintings it housed. The paintings had changed as well. Or, rather, they were as they had always been, but Lily saw them more clearly now. She understood how they had never been confined within their frames. The wild colours, the mad lines, spilled out across the wall, enveloping everything they touched. The desk, the bookcase, the darkened windows, all rippled as though moved by the brush of a hyperactive artist. Her ears roared. It was merely the crackling of the fire but amplified almost to the point of pain. A rich hum joined it, slow and substantial, as the crashing of waves on the strand. The sound of Strangford's voice. She couldn't make out the words, but she could see his concern. He had come closer, kneeling beside her. She had just arrived at the conclusion that she should reassure him when all the lines in the room fell apart. She fell from impression to abstraction, enveloped in a stunning nonsense of shape and colour that meant nothing and everything. It was a language she had forgotten, but if she could learn to read it, this painting that was life, she would understand everything. The answer to every question she had ever struggled with. Electricity surged through her. Circuits mated that had previously been severed. Connections arced and fired, and abruptly, shatteringly, the lights came on. She went somewhere else. Sprawled across an enormous four-poster bed, the light of a fire dancing over the sheets. Soft, sensitive hands roam over her body. Skin brushes against skin setting off sparks of precise and wildly intense connection. She clasps Strangford's face in her palms, tastes him, feels the silk of his lips against her own. Pleasure rises, crests like a wave, 
then breaks with the roar of artillery shells. Crouching in a hole in the ground built of mud and barbed wire, she is wet, bone-drenched, rattling with cold as the earth shakes under the assault. Strangford, his uniform covered in mud, shouts at her, voice hoarse, roaring for her to go, 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 go. Gloved hands shove her. She tumbles back as the wall explodes, mud and wire and splintering wood blowing past her, landing on her back in a field, the seed heads of the greenest grass in the world dancing over her head. A fat bee buzzes from wildflower to wildflower. She sits up, climbs to her feet. The field goes on forever, perfect in its silence, lined with row after endless row of plain white crosses, marching in stillness to eternity. A field of a million nameless, dead. Back in London, the rain sleeting down, Sam Wu glaring at her with unspeakable grief in his eyes. The ravens pour down from the sky, surround him like a whirlwind, a maelstrom of black beaks, feathers, alien intelligence gleaming from dark pebble eyes, shining from the face of a photograph cradled in the big hands of Dr. Gardner, slumped in an iron chair in the ward at St. Bart's, an empty bed beside him, sheets stained, his heavy shoulders racked with sobs, rain streaking down Cairn Cross's face as he stands outside the refuge, a great brass key in his hand, the iron set to his face as he turns it, flipping the tumblers and locking the door. Inside the attic, spinning dust catching the golden light of the late afternoon sun, the curtains gone, the mural shining out at her from every angle, the bright colours an assault. Truth leaps at her from every detail, the boy with the rats worshipping at his feet, the healer with a wounded soul, a warrior crowned with the golden light of a saint, black gauntlets on his hands, because they need protecting and because they are dangerous. A thin woman laughs, delighted, in the bony arms of the dancing dead. The artist wears a paint-stained apron, jars and brushes scattered at her feet. She sets another key into the robe of the flame-haired woman on the wall, working on a painting she completed thirty years ago. This can't be right, Lily protests. I'm not capable of seeing the past. You have no idea what you are capable of, Evangelina Ash replies. This isn't what I came here for. I have to find Estelle. Then stop fighting and ask for what you want. Lily moves to the figure in the circle of skeletons, the laughing woman robed in peacock blue. Stop fighting. Ask for what you want. It is impossible. Even in the midst of this barrage of things to come, the fight coils tightly around her. It is what keeps her from falling into the abyss, from losing herself to despair or something worse. How can she stop? What will be left of her if she does? The pain roars back in with a few notes of an old music hall jingle, with the glitter of jewels in a pool of blood. If she is not in control, then how can she possibly protect herself? She can't. She stops inside the stillness, the dust floating in the air, the light suspended around her. The truth of it settles in. Lily acknowledges it, and the coil releases, leaving her defenseless. She shapes the words inside herself, carefully and deliberately, then speaks them aloud. Show me where I will find her. And she is there. It is the dark space she has seen before, towering walls made of dark glass, glittering in the flickering flame of a single lantern. This time, she is aware of the smell in the air, 
rotting wood, Thames mud, mice. A warehouse set somewhere on the river. But where on the river? There are a hundred such places, a hundred possibilities. Estelle lies on a table. It has arms, elegant limbs of articulated metal. One embraces Estelle, wrapped across her chest, holding her down. Another extends up from the surface, fingers pressing a wrinkled ball of white fabric against her nose and mouth. A man steps into view. He pulls a dropper from a brown vial and measures a dose onto the bunched cloth, then moves away again. She hears the clatter of glass as Waddington shifts bottles aside, pulling up a tray of equipment. There are clamps, fat needles. A rubber tube wriggles like the body of a snake. This doesn't tell her what she needs to know. She must find another perspective. Dark glass glints over the lieutenant's shoulder. It is a window, just visible between the stacks of crates. There. Go there, Lily thinks. And she does. Waddington is next to her, close enough that she can smell the damp linen of his coat. It is too intimate, this nearness, her whole being aware of the horror of what this ordinary man has done. He must sense her presence, but he does not, because she is not really there. He is not really there. Not yet. This is the future, something that has not been, perhaps by as little as a moment or two. It is Lily's power answering her demand, taking her as close as it can to what she seeks. Waddington moves away, and Lily returns to her purpose. She focuses on the glass, on seeing through the darkness to what lies beyond. Narrow water, black and still, where otherwise a road might have been. Across the open space is another row of warehouses. They are bland, anonymous, a view one might see a hundred places in London, were it not for the steel dragon clinging to the facade. The beast is long its tail submerged in the dark water. The metal head extends out from the roof while thin folds of skeletal iron wings arch back against the skyline. Lily knows her mind is filling in gaps in the details, substituting for the things here she does not yet know, like a child finding monsters in the clouds. She needs more to reliably orient herself, to find something unmistakably familiar. She looks to the broad expanses of the Thames. Two dark pinnacles, barely visible against the dull glow of the clouded sky, rise above the water. They form a silhouette no Londoner could possibly fail to recognise. Tower Bridge. But from what angle? She is on some kind of inlet. There are two inlets this close to the bridge, St. Catherine's Docks beside the tower, and St. Saviour's Dock on the Southwark side, otherwise known as Shad Thames, where the now demolished rookery of Jacob's Island once reigned terror. St. Catherine's is a short waterway, one that gives quickly onto two great basins. She moves closer to the window, peering down the length of the inlet. It narrows, disappearing into the darkness between the closest buildings. Her heart thuds noisily against her ribs. She knows where she is. Behind her, Waddington lifts a syringe. The needle glints in the lamplight. Estelle groans. The room shifts beneath her and she falls, tipping backwards past the crates through a dark hole in the floor. She crashes into ice-cold water, then fights for the surface, choking. But something holds her down. She is submerged in the frozen darkness, lungs screaming for release, pushed to the edge of their resistance. Then she is free. She surfaces, gasping. She is not in the warehouse. It is a tiled bathroom, and Lily sits in a tub full of water, 
and floating chunks of ice. A narrow window looks out over a broad stretch of open ground. Familiar ground. Some place she has been before. Two men in white uniforms grasp her by the arms and drag her from the tub. She has pulled down a long hallway, past rows of closed and locked doors. It is a prison. No. It is some place worse. She thinks of the horror of the burnt-out hospital, the tiled underground hallway lined with quiet nightmares, a place where no one would answer your screams. Panic chokes her, fear buzzing in her brain. She wants to escape. She wants to go home, to hide from all the knowledge she doesn't want to have. She wants to be free of this terrible gift, free of its limits and its dreadful responsibilities. She wants... Stop fighting. Ask. It is impossible. She always fights. It is how she has survived despite the pain, the constant weight of failure. She battles for control either by shutting the thing out or by trying to wrestle it into submission. Grants it the narrowest crack of entry, directed toward her own dire purpose. But perhaps, just perhaps, there is another purpose at play. Perhaps there always has been. Her arms ache under the grip of the uniformed men. Her knees drag against the tiled floor, the doors sliding past her. She knows what waits for her at the end of this hallway. It is horrible. She closes her eyes. For the first time, she lets go. Show me what you want me to see. She speaks aloud. The men are gone. She stands alone in the hallway lined with doors. It has grown longer, stretching infinitely before and behind her. Thousands upon countless thousands of doors. She holds her walking stick in one hand. It has grown taller, magnificent, sprouting green leaves and red berries. In the other hand, she holds a key. It shifts and shimmers in her grasp, changing shape with every movement of her wrist. The doors whisper to her. They are infinite and they are powerful, every one opening to an as yet unthought future, to endless possibility. And she holds the key. For a moment it dawns. She comprehends it, understands the unimaginable potential that lies before her and her astonishing place in it. You have no idea what you are capable of. The power and the responsibility is greater than she had ever dared to suspect. It is as wonderful as it is terrifying. She wants to run. She wants to wish herself back to ignorance. She wants to laugh. Should she choose? Does she dare? The door waits before her, one of millions. The key shifts in her hand. She fits it to the lock, turns it. Light spills through, impossibly bright. Something moves on the far side, something familiar, something utterly new, coming toward her. And then she returned. The floor of Strangford's study did not feel comfortable any longer. There was a crick in her neck, and her mouth was dry, suffused with a terrible taste. For God's sake, Lily, wake up! Fear had stripped Strangford's voice raw. She opened her eyes. He knelt beside her, hair askew, as worried as she had ever seen him. His eyes closed in relief, and he moved back as she slowly sat up. The paintings had returned to their frames. 
The fire crackled softly in the hearth, the darkness still lingering outside the tall panes of the windows. It flooded back to her, the impact of everything she had seen, running over her like a freight train. Strangford's hands on her body, the sight of him obliterated in an explosion of mud and wire, the endless sea of graves. Sam and Gardner shattered, the refuge locked and abandoned. All the doors, the key she held in her hand. She had touched something, come close to an understanding that would change everything. It was slipping away from her even now, fading like the wisdom of a dream. One certainty remained. There would be no walking away from this. Not again. Not ever. No matter how hard it got. There was no time to worry at it any further. They had to get to Estelle. While she'd been dreaming, Hartwell had been making his preparations. How much had all those detours cost her? How long has it been? The words were thick in her mouth. She felt a quick panic cut through the lingering fog of the vision. How narrow had their window become? Or had they used it up entirely? Twenty-three minutes, Strangford replied. She winced. Her head was pounding. That's not possible. I can assure you, I was quite aware of the time, he retorted. She risked a look at him. You were worried she said. You drank what looked like a bottle of poison and then fell into a stupor. Of course I was worried. Can you stand? I think so. He put a hand under her arm, another at her back, and helped her rise. She was aware of the pressure of his fingers against her skin, her senses sharp, still tingling from the after-effects of the drug. He kept his hold on her as she reached her feet as though afraid she would fall over if he let go. It put him close to her. He was not happy. You're lucky I didn't drag you out into a carriage and drive you straight to St. Bart's, he declared. A carriage, she muttered. The rest of the pieces fell into place. She grabbed Strangford's arm hard. We need a carriage, now. She met his dark eyes her own intent sharpening, becoming clear. I know where to find Estelle. Thirty. The storm rattled the windows of the carriage, a gust of wind making it sway. Snow blew past in violent swirls. Lily felt a pang of guilt at the thought of the driver bundled in layers of scarves, hunched over the reins. Their progress was much slower than she would have liked, but they had been lucky to find this hackney at all. Even at Paddington Station, there had been only a handful of carriages waiting at a curb usually lined with dozens. Roderick, who had been sent running the half-mile to the station from Strangford's home, had sent this one back to them, taking another himself in the opposite direction. He would make his way north through the storm to wake the refuge, and summon help. Strangford had seemed poised for resistance when he demanded that they alert Ash and the others. Lily hadn't fought him. Whatever reticence she might once have had about imposing in such a manner on people who owed nothing to her was gone, obliterated in the need of the hour. She had quickly vetoed Strangford's suggestion that she be the one to head to Bedford Square, letting Roderick join him to proceed directly to the warehouse. She was the one best positioned to recognize the right place, and besides, she doubted Roderick would be any use in a fight. And she was expecting a fight. She shifted her grip on the walking stick she had plucked from the stand at Strangford's door. It was ironwood, heavier and less flexible than the yew she was accustomed to carrying. It would do. The carriage skidded around a turn, and the driver slackened his pace making their progress through the deserted, snow-covered streets of the city even slower. 
Lily glimpsed the dark silhouette of Tower Bridge through a gap in the buildings. They were getting closer, but the state of the roads left her with no illusion about how quickly Roderick would be able to reach Bloomsbury. She and Strangford could not afford to wait for the others to arrive. They were in this on their own. Inside the carriage, silence carried weight. Lily knew it should be broken, but each means she grasped to do so dissolved from beneath her, seeming paltry and insubstantial in the face of all that had passed between her and the man beside her. It was Strangford who broke the impasse. There is something I must make clear, in case tonight's errand proves. Well, the pause after the word spoke volumes. I'm sure that's not necessary, Lily countered. Are you? She could feel his eyes on her. The question carried more weight when posed to a woman who could see the future. She looked away. He continued to speak, quietly, across the darkness of the carriage. I let something stand yesterday in the park. Something you said that I should have addressed. I would like to correct that. She realized that he was waiting, that he was asking for her permission to continue. She hesitated. The fear roared up by sheer habit, demanding that she stop him that she open the door and leap from this carriage before something was said that changed things in a way that could not be ignored or undone. She held firm against the onslaught. She was not running any more. Go ahead. The carriage rocked under another blast of wind. There is no time to be anything but blunt in this, so I beg you'll excuse my being less circumspect than I would prefer he said. In the park yesterday, you argued that because your mother was an actress. A whore, Lily cut in. She turned to look at him, defences prickling. My mother sold her body in exchange for the financial support of a protector. She was a whore. You argued, Strangford continued, relentless, that because of your parentage, you could never be anything but a mistress to a man of standing. The words bit even though Lily knew they were nothing more than the bold truth, plainly spoken. I need you to know that you are wrong, he quietly declared. My lord, Lily began, but he cut her off, uncharacteristically quick. No, I am a man of standing and you are already something other than that to me. You are a colleague. You are the only woman I have met who knows what it is like to be burdened with this terrible knowing. And you are my friend. He spoke the word fiercely, as though prepared to battle for it. I know your character. I have seen it, more intimately than anyone else possibly could. Your bravery, your strength such ferocious loyalty. I will not have you continue to live under the abominable notion that your worth begins and ends with the circumstances of your birth. You are more than that. He swallowed thickly, his voice fracturing, but pressing on. You are so much more than that. Something broke inside of her crumbling under the impact of his words. For a moment, she wondered if the rest of her would fall apart with it. She answered him quietly, but firmly. You can't just bat away the mores of an entire society, says the woman in trousers. She could hear the wryness in his tone and felt an answering tug at the corner of her own mouth. I should have said that to you yesterday, he went on. I didn't, because I was afraid it would seem like an invitation. He stopped, catching himself. No, that isn't what I mean, it's... Me, Lily, he finished, 
as something in him seemed to give way. It's me. For anyone to be close to me is unavoidably. They would lose everything. Every secret, every scrap of privacy. That place inside yourself where you keep the things that are only yours. It would be an inordinate sacrifice. One that could not possibly be comprehended until after it was already made. He took a deep breath. I just... I know. Lily cut in softly. In the shadows of the carriage, Lily felt the distance between them grow closer. Filled with something like fire. It licked at her, both drawing her in and threatening to consume her. If I were only a little less. Don't you dare, she snapped. Don't you dare wish yourself other than what you are. The silence extended, the carriage rattling over the bridge. Well, Strangford said at last, rubbing his gloved hands across his knees. I am glad we have clarified things. Lily burst out with a laugh. She felt him smile back at her through the dark, and the tension built again, setting her aflame with awareness. Her resistance to it had weakened, inviting all manner of complicated possibilities. The carriage lurched. Lily grabbed the strap as they slid to a stop. Strangford glanced out the glass. We're here, he announced. Lily climbed down into the whirling storm. The carriage had reached the end of Shad Thames, where Jamaica Road swallowed the last narrow sliver of the old river Neckinger. The dark water of St. Saviour's Dock wove out before them, visible through the veil of drifting white. Strangford joined her, his boots crunching against the frozen ground. Where is it? he asked. Somewhere on the east bank, near where it meets the Thames, Lily replied. Should we keep the carriage? She glanced back at the hackney, the driver a round pile of snow-dusted rags. We don't know how long it will take, she pointed out, or whether they would be back at all. He moved to the driver. Lily knew the man would be compensated generously for delivering them here, to the heart of this old haven of thieves. The slum had long since been levelled into the ground, the mills and warehouses lining the dock springing up in its place. The carriage rolled slowly away behind them. Lily tried not to feel as though some lifeline were being severed. Strangford came beside her. Would you take my arm? He quietly offered. Surprise made her hesitate. It is rather slippery, he added. She answered by setting her hand around his sleeve. They walked up Mill Street, leaning against the blowing snow. At the end of the lane, a low arch opened onto a glimpse of the darkly glimmering Thames and the shadowy length of a wharf. Beside them, another entry opened into a narrow yard set before a long brick building. The windows of the ground floor were blocked up with only a slim iron vent at the top. The warehouse was old, stained with decades of soot. But the doors were not. They were sturdy oak, set with new locks. On the upper floors, the glass of the windows was dark, reflecting only the faint light of the gas lamps that lined the distant road. It looked silent, still, and deserted. She tried to match it to the place from her vision. She couldn't. The window she had peered from must have been near the Thames, but how near? Assuming there was a real place to be found at all, that her vision wasn't just some drug-addled nightmare. No, she thought, clear and certain. It had not been a dream. She couldn't doubt that any more, no matter how much safer it might make her feel. Where's Sam when you need him? Strangford muttered eyeing the brass locks. We're looking at this from the wrong angle. I need to see it from the river to know where we are. She glanced back at the lane. 
We need a boat. They ducked into the narrow arch that opened onto the wharf. Rows of fishing boats and barges that plied the waters of the river during daylight hours rocked quietly against the piers. Sails bundled against their booms. Lily's eyes lit on a rowboat tied to the far end. Then her instinct flared. She moved her grip to Strangford's hand, tugging him forward. They reached a ladder mounted against the side of the wharf. Down, she hissed. He descended quickly and quietly, Lily following nimbly after him. Strangford made room for her on the ladder, hanging from the side of it. They went still, boots suspended a few inches from the cold, lapping water of the Thames. Footsteps echoed across the boards, accompanied by a low, tuneless whistle. Lily clung to the ladder, willing herself to complete silence, close enough to Strangford to feel the warmth of his body through his coat. The footsteps passed. She waited, the instinct still prickling. After an eternity, she heard them return, the regular thud of some night watchman making his rounds. She waited until he had receded through the narrow arch, then slowly allowed herself to breathe. It had been stronger this time. The little pricks of awareness she had felt in the Southwark Hospital and in Hartwell's stairwell had blossomed into something else, a clear and undeniable knowing. The drug had provoked more in her than just the vision on Strangford's floor. It was possible it was merely some lingering fragment of the stuff in her system, she clung to that explanation. The alternative was far less comforting. Her father's voice came back to her. I remember your hunches. We can move, she said, keeping her voice even, not wanting Strangford to see how shaken she was. They climbed back onto the wharf, making their way quickly and quietly to the rowboat. Lily jumped in, settling the walking stick on the floor. Strangford untied the rope and tossed it down, then stepped in himself and took up the oars. He rowed quietly, dipping them expertly into the water and gliding the little craft along the dark river. They turned into the mouth of the dock. He stopped once they had passed into the protected waters with their milder current. The boat floated before the water side of the warehouse. Lily studied the buildings lining the opposite side of the dock. The perspective was different. She was lower, at the water level, not perched near the roof of the building. From this angle, there was no way to see the familiar silhouette of Tower Bridge, nor was there anything distinct about the buildings themselves. They looked like any other riverside block in the city, save for the distinct shape of a hoist suspended from one of the warehouses that bordered the water. The steel crown of it thrust out over the dock, while a counterweight of elegant girders arched back over the roof. She felt a familiar pattern in it, could imagine steel jaws and dark wings. We're here, she confirmed. She looked back at the warehouse, studying the facade. The brick walls extended down into the water, where perhaps at a lower tide, the pilings that supported the building might be visible. It was solid, save for a set of massive doors at the far end. Look, up there, Strangford said. Lily followed the direction of his gaze. Behind one of the dark windows of the top floor of the building, something flickered. A brief flash of lamplight. There, and then gone again. There was someone inside. We need a way in, Strangford pointed out. Lily's gaze returned to those enormous doors. There were similar openings facing the city's canals on buildings that had been set over some arm of the water. They were used to allow barges to carry goods directly inside, to unload without having to be ported by hand onto the shore, and then transferred. She looked more closely at the shadowy space between the bottom of the door and the water. There's a gap. She kept her voice low. Under the door. 
Strangford eyed it dubiously. It's too narrow for me to row us in, he countered. Not if we're sitting up. He considered the gap, frowning. It's still rather close. I don't see an alternative, Lily returned. We could wait for the others. Sam could. There isn't any time, she cut in. She saw him weigh it. Two undesirable options. He picked up the oars, rowed the boat to the far bank of the dock, then turned the craft around, pointing the bow at the doors. Guide me, he ordered. Lily nodded. He began to pull, setting aside silence for long shore strokes of the oars. The boat picked up momentum, slicing across the narrow water. More to the left, she instructed. There's still a current. He adjusted course, the doors rapidly approaching. Lily eyed them uncomfortably, the slender black space beneath looking far less generous than it had from a distance. They drew closer, the boat moving faster. Now, she whispered, sliding herself down to the floor. Strangford pulled up the oars, then dove down beside her. They were tucked into an awkward intimacy, pressed against each other on the angled planks. The boat continued to glide forward, propelled by the remaining momentum of Strangford's strokes. Looking up, Lily watched the bottom of the thick, water-stained doors approach, and then pass smoothly over her head. The boat scraped lightly against the wood, bumped up by a low ripple in the water. They were inside. She stayed low, pressed against Strangford's body as they continued to drift forward. She could feel his breath on her hair. They stopped abruptly, bumping up against an unseen obstacle. The hollow sound of it echoed through a broad, open space. Lily felt her pulse jump. She remained still in the bottom of the boat, listening intently for some sign that their intrusion had been detected. Beyond the gentle lapping of water against wood, the space around them was silent. Finally, she rose. They were bobbing against the side of a square pool set into the heart of the warehouse. It was open above them to a dizzying height, the rafters just visible overhead. Around her, the massive space was largely deserted. A few sacks of rotting flour were piled against one of the walls, a ghostly bulk in the near darkness. With the windows bricked up, the interior was lost in gloom. It smelled of Thames mud and mice. She thought of the sturdy new doors set into the street side of the building. No one would go to the expense of all that oak and brass to protect an empty room. Nearby, the steel beam of a hoist rose from the water, towering up to the ceiling of the building. Lily could see the hydraulic engine that powered it resting on the warehouse floor. It looked well-oiled, free of rust. The hook that would haul pallets of goods to the upper floors dangled from its cable. The place might look deserted, but it wasn't. Someone had a use for it. Something was being kept here they were motivated to protect. Strangford grabbed the side of the pool and pulled himself out onto the warehouse floor. He held the boat steady as Lily did the same. Then he turned the craft and gave it a strong push toward the doors. It drifted forward, bombing its way back out of the building. She knew why he had done it. The presence of a rowboat in the pool would be a clear indicator that there were intruders in the building. With it gone, there was less chance that Waddington would guess his hiding place was discovered. They could hardly fit three bodies into the floor of it to effect their escape, not with the tide rising. Still, the sight of it gliding away clenched at her, taking with it their only sure means of getting free of this place. A wooden ladder was mounted beside the steel beam of the hoist, extending up to the floor above. Strangford indicated it, and Lily nodded, 
She tucked the walking stick into the back of her belt as he started to climb, then followed him. Their progress was silent, save for the rush of her breath, until one of the wooden rungs snapped under the weight of Strangford's boot. The sound cracked across the space, echoing like a thunderclap. Lily froze. Perhaps he hadn't heard it. No. It would have been impossible to miss in the heavy silence around them. Would he dismiss it as the building settling, or the machinery of some nearby factory clanging into gear for the morning shift? Perhaps he wasn't even there anymore. He might have gone. There was nowhere he would go. Not at this hour. Not with a kidnapped woman in his care. Warrington was here, and he had heard them. Strangford appeared to know it as well. He climbed quickly, but quietly, up the rest of the ladder, then ducked behind the bulk of a massive wooden crate, motioning urgently for Lily to join him. She tucked herself in beside him, pulling the stick from her belt, and waited. Like the level below, the space around her sprawled across one enormous room, but it was not empty. The rows of windows let in a soft, ambient light from the street below. The floor was a jumble of furniture. Rows of hospital beds stood upright, pressed together like dominoes. Chairs were bound together with rope into tower-like stacks. Islands of rolling carts and tables turned the place into a maze of narrow aisles, lined with things that would move and clang with the slightest bump. At the far end of the maze, another set of double doors opened onto a stairwell. She put her lips to Strangford's ear and whispered, Were we heard? We must assume so. He considered the shadowy landscape. If he's waiting, he'll do it at the top of the ladder. And if he isn't waiting, it's easier to fight on stairs. He slipped out of their hiding place and wove his way silently across the floor. Lily followed, keeping her steps light, carefully bending out of the way of the jutting angles of the stacks of furniture. One bump could send some tower toppling, setting off a racket that revealed to Waddington exactly where they were. Everything here was new. The wood veneers were free of chips and stains. The metal coils of the beds showed no rust. None of this had been here for very long. It had been purchased and brought here fairly recently, a thought that left her feeling even more uneasy. It came to her what united the assortment of furnishings and supplies that surrounded her. This was the equipment one would need in any hospital. She had never questioned why Waddington might have come here, she had naively assumed that he was simply a squatter, making the space available to himself. Of course, Waddington would never do that. He was far too careful, too deliberate. He would have had to know this location was secure before he would bring another victim here. And he had. He had known it because this was Hartwell's warehouse, packed with Hartwell's goods the furniture and supplies he needed to open up another hospital. Her mind flew back to the burnt shell of the clinic, to the horror of the tiled basement and the monstrous operating room. He was going to do it again, in some other place, to a new batch of women. The evidence of it was all around her. Hampstead Heath, she thought remembering the mortgage papers on his desk. Strangford extended a hand. Lily took it, letting him help her over a mattress that had slid out of its pile, blocking their path. Through his black glove, his grip was strong and steady. You are so much more than that. She set the thought firmly aside. Then they were at the door. 31.
The stairs were broad, lined with a sturdy iron rail. Narrow windows cut into the brick provided some illumination. It felt terribly exposed, that long expanse of metal and concrete extending before and behind her. There was nowhere to dodge for cover. She listened for some sign that Waddington had anticipated their route and was waiting for them. Her blasted power should be able to show her this. Was it only going to cough up a warning when it wanted to, then skip off when she needed it? How long would the effect of the wine of Jerima last? The stairwell remained silent. Strangford met her gaze, then tilted his head up. Lily nodded. She climbed carefully, keeping her footfalls soft, her body close to the wall. As they rounded the last bend, they saw another open doorway leading into the top floor of the building. It was dark. She shifted her grip on the walking stick. Strangford glanced back at her and frowned. She knew he was fighting the instinct to tell her to stay behind. Instead of voicing it, he turned and moved to the doorway. They slipped inside and immediately pressed themselves against the wall. A slight rattle fell across the silence that filled the hall, Lily's back brushing up against a shelf loaded with ceramic basins. The sound was small, but she still stiffened against it, feeling terribly exposed. This level was different from the ones below. Where those had been vast and open, this was a warren made up of tall shelving units and stacks of wooden crates. The shelves and stacked boxes extended far above her head, creating tight alleys and small rooms that made it impossible to see more than a few yards ahead. The place was a labyrinth. A narrow hallway stretched before them. The contents of the boxes on either side of it were scrawled on labels. Linens, Lily read on the nearest one. Dozen flat sheets. Dozen pillowcases. Quilts. Five. Strangford led the way. Lily wanted to pull him back. After all, she was the one with a weapon, though the narrow confines of this space severely limited her ability to wield it properly. They moved past a shelf stacked twelve feet high with chamber pots, bundles of mops and brooms, crates of gauze and plaster. Their path twisted, turned into dead ends, doubled back on itself. All the while, she listened for some sign of Waddington. There was nothing. The silence broken only by the thump of her heart against her ribs, the rasp of her own breath. It didn't matter. She knew he was somewhere in the darkness, stalking them. A man who could slip into homes undetected, linger there in some shadow, then emerge to steal the blood of a sleeping occupant. He would be careful. He would wait until he had a full grasp of the situation before he acted. He would get the measure of the obstacle he faced and proceed thoughtfully, deliberately, to thwart it. Hartwell's superhuman was gifted with both the caution and the ruthlessness of a snake. They passed another alcove, a narrow space lined with jars. They were full, and Lily could make out some of the names on the labels. Iodine. Mineral spirits. Rubbing alcohol. Carbolic. Ammonia. Something glimmered in the glass of the arrayed rows of jars. A sliver of lamplight. Strangford put out his arm, warning her back. He eased forward, Lily following. They turned the corner and she found herself looking down a narrow hall, formed by stacks of crates, ending in a wider space illuminated by the glow of a paraffin lantern. They stopped short of entering it, backs pressed against the crates, keeping to the last bit of shadow as they peered into the room. Lily had seen it before. Shelves lined the space, glittering with glass vials and jars, racks of tubes in pipettes. In the centre of the room lay a table, a prone figure arranged on its surface. Estelle. A fall of white gauze obscured the lower half of her face, 
suspended over her nose and mouth by a metal rigging clamped to the side of the table. A canvas strap crossed her chest, holding her in place. She was very pale and very still. A needle protruded from her neck, attached to a rubber tube pinched shut by a metal clamp. Waddington had made everything ready for the next stage of Hartwell's research, for draining Estelle's blood from her body, using her own living heart to pump it into Waddington's veins. There was no sign of the doctor. Strangford pushed forward. He moved to Estelle and sniffed at the gauze. Chloroform, he said softly, meeting Lily's eyes across the table. The gauze was the mechanism Waddington was using to keep Estelle anaesthetized. Strangford plucked it from the rigging and tossed it aside. He worked at the straps that secured Estelle to the table. Lily's instincts prickled. She looked around. The room was still empty, still silent. But something would soon be here. Something dangerous. She adjusted her grip on the walking stick. Not too tight. Staying loose and flexible, just as she'd been taught. Strangford paused with his hand over the needle in Estelle's throat, then backed away, joining Lily by the shelves. I can't take the needle out, he whispered. I don't know what would happen if I did. Lily couldn't answer. For all she knew, it would leave an open wound in Estelle's neck, sending her blood pouring onto the floor. She wasn't a doctor. The only doctor here was a killer. She glanced back at the table. Estelle looked pale and terribly still. She seemed older than she ever had to Lily before, the lines on her face deeper and more harsh. Then the sense of threat abruptly peaked. The awareness was sharp, screaming through her. She grabbed Strangford by the arm and hauled him into a run, just as the shelves behind them lurched forward and came crashing to the ground. Glass exploded. Lily felt it pelt against her back. She heard Strangford curse and looked over to see him put a hand to a bright red gash in the flesh of his cheek. Estelle had been spared the brunt of the impact, though her caftan glittered here and there with tiny fragments of broken vials. Strangford rose, the broken glass sliding from his back and tinkling against the floor as it fell. She turned. Where the wall of shelves had once been, Waddington stood looking at them. His brown eyes were cold. They quickened with recognition when he looked at Lily. He reached into his lapel pocket and pulled out the shining silver blade of a scalpel. Get a still, Strangford ordered. He stepped forward his boots crunching on the glass. Lily felt a quick burst of fury. She was the one with a weapon in her hands, and therefore far better equipped to deal with a man with a knife, though the thought of avoiding that sharp, shining blade turned her stomach. But there was no time to protest. Waddington had hopped onto the shattered remains of the shelf, crossing it quickly and surely. Then the two men were upon each other. Lily's grip on the staff tensed her body ready to leap into the fight. The blade flashed in Waddington's hand, swinging low toward Strangford's gut. Strangford moved. The gesture was simple, light as the step of a dancer. His body twisted aside, one arm pressing into Waddington's, forcing the blade down. His other hand snapped up, striking a quick, sharp blow to the man's jaw. The doctor staggered back, then bulled forward again. He swung the blade. Strangford met him with another strange movement of his arms, made with the brutal grace of instinct. This time, the doctor landed on the ground. The Taiji Chuen, Lily realized. The art Ash had been teaching Strangford to increase his focus and control. He had told her it was also a school of self-defense. Strangford was applying it as such, whether intentionally or as a matter of reflex. From the floor, Waddington grabbed the heavy, broken remnant of a glass jar and whipped it at Strangford, forcing him to duck back. Then he was on his feet again. Behind her, Estelle groaned, her hand fluttering to the needle in her neck. 
Lily raced over, catching the woman's wandering fingers and forcing them back to her side. Waddington and Strangford came together again, but the doctor was prepared now, recognizing that Strangford's lack of a weapon didn't mean he was defenseless. He fainted with the blade, then surprised Strangford with a blow to the side. The force of it pushed him into another tall block of shelves. It wobbled, then tilted, crashing into the one behind it. Lily threw her body across the stells as more glass shattered onto the floor, knocking over the small table that held the kerosene lamp. It smashed. Flame rushed across the oil, spilling over the dry wood of the floorboards. The two men, locked in a ferocious embrace, lurched out of the half-demolished room. Lily looked to Estelle, who lay on the table, eyes closed, fingers twitching. She could hear the crashing sounds of the fight, smashing soup bowls and splintering wood. She dropped her stick, grabbed the table, and hauled it across the floor as far from the flames as she could get before running into the debris of the fallen shelves. Then she picked her weapon up again and ran toward the sounds of battle. Another crash, the quick bark of a curse. Lily rounded a corner to see the two men squared off at the edge of the hole in the floor that opened down to the pool below. There was a new slit in the arm of Strangford's coat, a place where Waddington's blade had found a mark. Lily couldn't tell how deep it went. Strangford's cheek was bleeding, his jaw smeared with red. Waddington had him pinned, the dark abyss of the gap opening behind him. Stay back! Strangford barked. Lily ran forward. She snapped the ironwood at Waddington's side, but Strangford's protest had alerted him. The doctor turned as she approached, taking the blow at an angle and catching the stick in his hands. He wrenched it, and it slid from Lily's grasp, flying out over the hole on the floor. She heard it splash as it landed in the dark water below. He swung at her with a scalpel. Lily fell back to avoid it, landing on the rough floor. Waddington lunged to come at her again, but Strangford hit him from the side. The impact took them both to the edge, and then over it. She heard the water break as he hit it. She scrambled to the edge, looking down into the abyss, waiting, waiting. The gasp of his surfacing echoed up from below, she could barely make out the pale oval of his face against the dark water. Get out of there, Lily, he called. She glanced along the opening. Waddington hung from the floor a few yards away. As she watched, he swung his leg onto the surface, pulling himself up. His hand flashed out, grasping the silver glimmer of the scalpel. Lily ran. The firelight was dancing across the roof. The blaze was spreading. She had to get Estelle. She plunged back into the maze. The twists and turns felt like they were intent on tricking her, forcing her to double back. The air was thick with smoke, her lungs burning. She wanted to cough but fought the urge, instead crouching, moving lower to the ground, waiting all the time for some sign of Waddington behind her. At last, she rounded another corner and found herself back in the room of glass. Estelle was still on the table, but she was sitting up, her eyes open. The room around her danced with flame. The needle rested in her palm. Blood streamed from her neck, staining the side of her caftan. Lily hurried to her and pressed Estelle's hand to the wound. We have to go, she said, trying to keep her voice calm. It was as though Estelle didn't hear her. Her gaze was distant, unaware of the building turning into an inferno around her. She muttered something. Lily couldn't understand the words. They were nonsense, or some language she had never learned. Estelle, please, I need you to stand up. The medium's eyes drifted to Lily, then kept going coming to gaze at some unknown distance over her shoulder. Thief, she said, the blood oozing from between her fingers. 
The word was thick, heavy with an accent that was not Estelle's. Murderer. Aluga. Aluga. Blood drinker. Hebrew, the language of Maria Resnick, a woman driven to self-destruction by Waddington's use of her body, her blood. The words of a dead woman coming from the mouth of a woman who could hear the dead. Estelle wasn't gazing into the distance. She was channeling the voice of a victim who was looking into the eyes of her killer. Right over Lily's left shoulder. She dropped. Instead of driving into her neck, the scalpel screamed over the top of her head. Lily scrambled around the table, lurching back to her feet. She grabbed a piece of shelving as she rose, whipping it back at Waddington, who paused to take the blow against his shoulder. She skidded around the corner, taking the broken board with her. Splinters dug into her palm. At the far end of the wood, the pointed end of a wrenched nail protruded. Waddington leapt at her. He caught her around the waist, his breath hot against her neck, his grip like an iron coil around her body. Instinct sang, and she threw the board up in front of her. The scalpel that sliced toward her throat instead collided with the wood. She kicked out at the solid brick wall in front of her, driving Waddington back into the shelf behind. He loosened his grip on her to protect himself from a fall of glass spilling down from above, giving Lily time to put an arm's length of distance between them. He shifted his grip on the blade and moved toward her. He would kill her. She knew he would do it without a moment's thought or hesitation. Her lungs spasmed, her eyes burning. She made a desperate swing with the board. He dodged it, then retaliated. The blade flashed toward her ribs. She deflected the blow with the plank, pulling together some shred of control. He would come for her again, just as he had before. She needed to be ready. He charged. Lily threw herself to the side. She swung as she moved, driving the board at him from behind as he passed her. She aimed for his head and connected. The wood hit Waddington with a sharp crack, then stuck. He lurched forward, the movement pulling the weapon from her hands. It was lodged in his head the nail driven deep into his skull. He crumbled to his knees, looking back at her with quiet surprise. Then he fell. Lily stared down. Blood trickled from the place where the iron had driven through his brain. His eyes were open, sightless. He did not move. The horror of that began to creep in, paralyzing her. Then another crash resounded through the warehouse, the smoke growing thicker. She needed to get out of here. Back in the operating room, Estelle was on her feet, wavering and unsteady. Lily, someone set the room on fire. She pointed out mildly. Lily pulled Estelle's arm over her shoulder, bracing her own around the woman's waist. She propelled her forward. They skirted the inferno, plunging back into the dark maze of hallways. She passed the alcove of chemicals, now lying in shattered puddles on the floor, the stench choking her as thickly as the smoke. Lily tried desperately to pull together the memory of the way they had come. Had it been right or left after that stack of crates? Straight or turn after the jumble of IV stands? Then she saw it, the door to the stairs lying at the end of the long, narrow hallway. Behind her came another crash of crumbling, burning wood. Something in the air shifted. The atmosphere seemed to pull away from her, then rapidly expand again. There was a whoosh, low and substantial, followed by the thunder of flames igniting several gallons of volatile chemicals. She was thrown with Estelle into the shelf beside them, Chamber pots crashed to the ground, throwing up splinters of porcelain. 
the floor creaked, aching under the suddenly unbearable weight of Hartwell's next endeavor. Lily hauled Estelle upright, then dragged her forward, her boots skidding on the floorboards. She heard more crashing behind her, shelves collapsing as the floor beneath them gave way. The blaze roared like a hungry beast, the air unbreathable. She gasped as they spilled out into the stairwell. She pulled Estelle along, half stumbling their way down. As they passed the floor of furniture, Lily glanced through the doorway just long enough to see that it, too, was now ablaze. Strangford. Had he tried to climb back up into the warehouse to find them? Was he somewhere in that burning nightmare? The thought sent a panic screaming through her, threatening to cloud her thoughts more thickly than the smoke. Estelle's arm pulled against her shoulder, the smoke choking her. Lily had to get her out of the building. She ripped herself away from the burning maze, forcing them the rest of the way down the stairs. At the bottom, they fell against the massive door. Lily let Estelle sink to the ground, freeing her arms to wrestle with the deadbolt. She pushed the door open, clean air spilling over them. Lily hauled up Estelle and staggered with her out into the snow-covered yard. The slap of cold winter brought home how hellishly hot the interior of the building had become. The clarity of the air invading her lungs burned worse than the smoke. She collapsed into a cough, gasping for oxygen. She fell to her knees in the snow, Estelle drifting more slowly down beside her. Where was Strangford? The storm had passed. The air was still. Further up the Thames, the sky turned the soft pink of early dawn. Carriage wheels crunched across the yard. The horses that pulled the vehicle were matched. A pair of perfect bays. The black lacquer of the body of it was polished as shiny as a hearse. It stopped just before where she crouched in the snow. The door opened, and a familiar figure stepped out. The long, elegant form of one of the Empire's most distinguished physicians. You, Hartwell noted, considering Lily as she gasped and choked on the ground. I suppose I should have expected as much when I saw the smoke. More boots crunched against the snow. Any sign of Lieutenant Waddington? He asked as two new sets of feet moved into Lily's view. He's dead, she wheezed. That is unfortunate, he sighed. Let's salvage what we can from this. He lifted his gaze to the blazing warehouse. At least it's insured. He turned to the trunk strapped to the rear of the vehicle, tossing it open. He pulled a narrow case from inside. Put them both in the carriage, please, Hartwell ordered. Rough hands grabbed Lily's arms, hauling her upright. She recognized the face of the man who held her. It was Gibbs, the one who had made the bruises that still ringed her throat under the wool of her scarf. She was too breathless to fight him, still winded by the impact of the clear, cold air. As he dragged her to the carriage, her heels leaving twin tracks in the snow, she watched the roof of the warehouse dip, then collapse. The fire roared hungrily in response. The whole building was ablaze, every window shining with firelight. The import of it hit her with the force of a train. If Strangford was inside that building, he was dead. Agony shot through her, a pain so sharp and complete it overwhelmed all thought. Hartwell plunged a needle through the cork of a vial of clear liquid. He lifted the syringe. Bring her over by the carriage light, please. I need a vein, he said. Lily was thrust against the front of the carriage, her head knocking against the lacquered wood. 
The glare of the kerosene headlamp hurt her eyes. Two men held her body pinned in place. Hartwell took a handful of her hair, yanking back her head. There we are, he announced. The needle slipped into her neck. The world went grey. The fire seemed to rage in the distance like the memory of something that had happened a very long time ago. Strangford. The thought carried a last, desperate resistance. Then the darkness slipped over her. 32. Lily woke on the floor of a bare, narrow room. The walls were white the acrid smell of fresh paint still thick in the air. The space was illuminated by the harsh glare of an electric bulb, mounted on the wall and encased in a steel grid. She crawled to her feet. Her mouth felt as though it had been stuffed with cotton, her head equally thick. Her clothes reeked of smoke. It was cold. The room was completely bare, empty of any furnishings. It measured little more than a prison cell. A single window was set into the wall opposite the door. It was covered by another steel grid hung on hinges, bolted to the frame and secured with a weighty padlock. She peered past it through the glass. This certainly wasn't London. The landscape outside was pristine countryside, snow-covered fields and little tufts of woodlands. It was also vaguely familiar. She studied the low stone walls, the gorse hedges lining the gentle curve of the road. Hampstead Heath. Of course it looked familiar. She had taken her triumph up and down these roads dozens of times, though never before in the snow. The curve she could see below her was the same one she had crashed on a few short weeks before. But where was she seeing it from? She forced her mind back to the day her chain had broken and flashed to the image of a great, sprawling old manor, sitting derelict on a low rise over the road. It had been enveloped in an air of desertion and neglect, despite the scaffolding covering one of the wings, causing Strangford to lead her to the farmhouse further down the lane for assistance. Strangford. Her mind shot back to a more recent memory, her last before she woke in this place. The glow of burning embers shooting up into the sky as the warehouse roof collapsed. Had he been inside? Had he climbed up out of the dark pool in the building's core to try to find her? If he had, he was dead. Nothing could have survived that blaze. Nothing. Grief stabbed through her. She had pushed him away, done everything she could to drive him off. And why? Because she was so determined not to become any man's mistress? No. She could see it all so clearly now. It had never been about a refusal to follow in her mother's footsteps. It was fear, pure and simple. Fear of caring about someone. Fear of letting that need make her vulnerable, open to the possibility of being abandoned again, just like her father had abandoned her. Because of that fear, she had refused to acknowledge how much Strangford had come to mean to her. Now he was almost certainly gone. The pain of that tore threatening to swallow her. She had to refuse it. She couldn't fall apart, not now, not yet. She needed to gather every resource she had to determine where she was and how she was going to get out of here. From the angle of the road, she must be inside the great abandoned house she had seen after she crashed. But how had she come here? Hartwell. Her last memory was of ashes dancing around his polished boots as he stood in the snow of the warehouse yard and a needle pierced her neck. He had drugged both her and Estelle, and now 
she was here. She remembered the papers she had seen on his desk, a mortgage for a property on Hampstead Heath. This was it, Hartwell's next project. But why had he brought her here? It had been just dawn when the warehouse had collapsed. The sun was still low on the horizon, but it was the wrong horizon. Lily was looking west, not east. It was sunset. The same day? Or had she been unconscious even longer? She felt a hum of alarm, an undeniable knowledge that someone was coming. A moment later, footsteps sounded in the hall. They stopped at the door to her room, which opened to reveal the solid figure of Mr. Gibbs. The doctor wants to see you in his office, he announced. His tone was bland, but he watched her with a wary hostility. What she would give for her walking stick. She considered the likelihood of talking him into helping her. There were still scabs on his hands and face, the marks of vicious little wounds inflicted on him by Sam's army of doves. No, she wouldn't get any assistance from that quarter. She followed him out into the hall. It was long and sterile, brightly lit by more steel-caged electric lamps. Doors marched into the distance in either direction, all identical save for the numbers neatly mounted to the left of each one. Lily had emerged from 109. She counted off the others as she passed them. 111, 113, 115. There was something vaguely familiar about the scene, but her mind refused to place it, instead thrumming with nervous energy. They reached a set of stairs, climbing a single flight and then turning into another identical hallway. More close-set regular doors marched by, numbers proceeding in rigid order. 201, 203, 205. Lily stopped at the door to room 207. It hung open, revealing a windowless tiled room dominated by an enormous iron tub. She remembered cold, the icy water closing over her head, lungs screaming for air as hands held her pinned beneath the surface. A fragment of the vision sparked by the wine of Jerima. What is that for? she demanded. Best hope you don't find out. Gibbs replied before shoving her on. The way branched at the end of the hall. One side was blocked by a tacked-up fall of painter's canvas. The space beyond it was dark, and a cold draught crept in around the gaps. A box of tools sat beside it, a carpenter saw, hammer and crowbar peeking out. Whatever renovation this place was undergoing was very much a work in progress. Gibbs turned her away from the curtain, leading her to the other end of the short hallway, where she stopped at the threshold of Hartwell's office. It had once been some gentleman's study, but the room was now in a mixed state of decay. Strips of paper had been torn from the walls, which were roughly sanded in some spots. The floorboards were bare, showing the small holes where rows of carpet nails once pierced them. An electric lamp, run on a cord that extended out into the hall, illuminated a heavy oak desk. There were a pair of windows, both tall and lacking the grill that covered the one in her room. Hartwell stood behind the desk. He finished inscribing a note on a medical file. He turned and dropped it into the open drawer of a filing cabinet behind him. The steel cabinet was clearly new and obviously fireproof. Hartwell closed and locked the drawer, putting the key back in his jacket pocket. Miss Albright, Doctor, Gibbs announced. Thank you, Mr. Gibbs. Hartwell dismissed him. Gibbs closed the office door, and Lily faced her enemy alone. I have been considering my options regarding you, he said. 
his tone expressing a mild irritation. Turning you over to the legal authorities is, of course, one possibility. But I am forced to admit, I do not find it as appealing now as I did earlier this evening. You have cost me a very great deal since then. A gust of wind rattled the smeared, filthy glass of the window panes. Beyond them, the sun was sinking lower, light fading behind a dark stretch of forest. The goods in the warehouse can be replaced, of course. I would not be so foolish as to leave myself exposed to such a loss. It will, however, delay matters. A delay that should not have been necessary. Yet all of that pales in comparison to the matter of Lieutenant Waddington. It was him, wasn't it? Lily's voice was calmer than it had any right to be. Dora Heller, Agnes McKenney, Sylvia Durst, Annalise Boyden. He was the one who did it. The lieutenant was a very resourceful man. How? she demanded. How did he get in without anyone knowing? Through the front door, I imagine, Hartwell replied, as though the matter should have been obvious. Except perhaps at Mrs. Boyden's. She would certainly have had a service entrance. He posed as a servant. A technician from the gasworks, Hartwell replied shortly. That was his idea, and a very clever one. It explained the need for a case full of equipment. The pieces fell into place. She remembered Sam's stories of the best way for a thief to break into a house. By being invited in, and simply failing to leave. There were enough tales of horrible accidents that resulted from faults and gas lines that no one would turn away a technician who claimed he was investigating a problem. All Waddington had to do was get inside and then disappear. In a busy household, everyone would assume that someone else had seen him out. He simply found himself a place to wait, then emerged when the time was right to go about his work. She remembered the vision that had started all of this. In it, a shadow wielding a silver needle had swept out of the closet in Estelle's bedroom. That was where he must have hidden. She might have run off with the gasworks man. Mrs. Bramble's comment to Miss Bard, overheard as Lily stood in the hallway, paralyzed by the horror of realizing that what she'd foreseen had come to pass. There had been other signs as well. In her vision of Annalise Boyden's death, the gas lamps in the room rose and fell, flickering like beacons. She had even been told it all but directly, she realized with a sick lurch in her gut. Every time I ask her about it, who was it that did you in, Agnes? She just shows me a lamp a built-in gas fixture. The ghost of Agnes McKenney, communicating with Estelle, sending her a precise and perfect warning that identified exactly who it was that killed her. The man who'd come about the lamps. Hartwell glared at her. Lieutenant Waddington was a unique resource, he went on. His hematological characteristics were extremely rare, and to find that combined with a very competent and discreet medical assistant. Well, the rub of it is that you are proving yourself an unusual menace. Which is why I have decided the most responsible course of action is to simply admit you. Admit me where? Here, he replied. An empty house. This is, or will be, the Greater Hampstead Ladies' Hospital, a private lunatic's asylum. He flipped through the remaining papers on his desk, making a quick notation. It is a far more appropriate solution to the problem you pose. After all, I would not find it at all surprising that your outrageous behaviour is, in fact, motivated by some 
mental disease. Sane women do not routinely go about London dressed as Tanner's boys, breaking into private property. It was also the quieter solution. The involvement of law enforcement meant a trial, and trials gathered reporters like flies. Though Lily had little faith that the justice system would be willing to listen to her accusations against Hartwell, the tabloid reporters would certainly lick them up, causing him the inconvenience of a scandal. By shutting her up in his asylum, he ensured that any truth she tried to speak would be dismissed as the raving of a lunatic. Someone will find you out, she shot back with more courage than she felt. Find me out for what? Practicing as a physician? Physicians don't murder people. His eyes narrowed. It is research, Miss Albright. Research with the potential to shape the course of the future of the human race. There can be no more meritorious purpose. Connections continued to fall into place, triggered by his nearness, by the urgency of her situation. She thought of a portrait on a gallery wall, a pointed warning from an artist thirty years dead. Mordecai Roth's story of a suitor spurned by a woman he had no logical reason to court. She recalled words spoken in the dim silence of Robert Ashe's sanctuary. My wife was a charismatic. Evangeline Ash, she said abruptly. At the sound of that name, Hartwell's attention sharpened. Careful, Miss Albright. Did you know? She pushed on, refusing to let him intimidate her into silence. Did you know what she was? I'm not sure I know what you mean. I think perhaps you do, Lily countered. This was never about research. It was about her. You couldn't have her then, so you set about taking some echo of what she was from anyone who fell under your power. There is nothing noble about that, Dr. Hartwell. It is simply greed. There was a pause, as though the room itself were holding its breath. He set his pen down on the table, hard enough to send a splatter of ink across the blotter. Do not pretend to see into my soul, he seethed. You think you stand on such firm moral ground? I am a doctor. I spent the first twenty years of my career in a charity hospital. I have seen the misery and degradation a human life can sink to. Every imaginable form of it. You pass judgment on me without a thought for the countless thousands whose future suffering will be alleviated because of what I empower our race to become. He caught himself, reining control back in. I forget myself. One doesn't reason with lunatics. He took up the pen again, made a few more quick notes in his careful hand. I will take the precaution of altering your name on the admission papers, though there isn't really anyone to come looking for you, is there? Nonetheless. He blotted the page, lifted it. Mrs. Amanda Church. Suffering from nervous mania. Treatment regimen. Water therapy. He spoke as he wrote. Lily thought of the horror of the great metal tub, of icy water, and the battle for air. He frowned, considering. I should really have you on laudanum. We can start with a full dose and reduce it based on your response. You may quite like it. It has a very calming effect. What about Estelle? She demanded. The surfaced. She won't be here long. I just need to find another research partner with a compatible blood type. Fear crept in. It moved quickly, wrapping cold tentacles around her heart. He could do it. 
he could do all of it. He could lock her back in that room under another woman's name. Even were she lucky enough to gain access to someone from outside, would they believe the ravings of a certified lunatic over the word of a respected physician? No one would hear her. No one would question her presence. Hartwell would gain complete control over her for as long as she lived, secreted away in hell. And Estelle? He would tear her apart as soon as he had the means. How could she stop him? She had nothing. There was no threat she could levy, nothing she could put on the table to try to bargain with him. Except there was. She had one asset that would almost certainly capture Hartwell's interest. But could she turn it into an appropriately powerful bargaining chip? What if I could provide you with a more desirable research subject? She asked. How would you possibly do that? Lily ignored his dismissive tone, pressing on. Assuming that I could, would you let Mr. Nerve go? You must have kept her drugged, as you did me. If she remembers anything of the warehouse or of Waddington, it will only be confused fragments. When she wakes here, you can tell her she was brought for medical attention and that you have no idea what happened to her. She'll believe you. She'd have no reason not to. I never told her anything about any of this. It's a plausible scenario, but I fail to see... She cut in before he could finish. If I can give you something better, will you swear to me, on your honour as a physician and a gentleman? The words nearly choked her, but Lily forced them out. Will you swear that you will release her unharmed? You've stood there judging my actions, and now you're offering to sacrifice some other life to protect one you value higher. I do hope you are aware of the hypocrisy of that. Just tell me whether you agree to my terms. Lily cut back. I reserve the right to judge whether the substitute you offer is truly a better subject, he replied. And I am not going to release the medium until this person, whomever she is, is securely under my care. Even then, the matter would have to be handled delicately. Do we have a bargain or not? If you can truly provide what you have promised, then yes, I can spare the woman. Though I fail to see how you can possibly do so, seeing as you have just been admitted to an asylum. He shook his head. Gibbs? There was no mirror here, no convenient basin full of water for her to gaze in. But she had to find something. Hartwell would never take her at her word on this. Like the guests at Estelle's seance, he needed a show, a demonstration. Her eyes moved to the shining black steel of the file cabinet, to the place where the light of the electric lamp was reflected on the surface of the dark metal. She took a breath, forcing back her awareness of Hartwell's thug returning to the door. She made herself ignore the words they spoke, honing her attention desperately on the glow in that false glass. This had to work. It had to. The fear nipped at her, trying to pull her attention away. She refused to give in to it. The light flickered, dancing like the flame of a candle across the black steel. The room narrowed, the far corners shifting into darkness. And then, only the light was left. Ask for what you want. Something now, she thought fiercely. Something quick and now. The vision presented itself to her, as clear as it was absurd. Then it was gone, and she was back in the mouldering study once again. She opened her mouth, the words falling quickly from her lips. A lorry is about to pass down the road. White, headlamps on. It... She paused at the absurdity of it, then ploughed forward. She couldn't question it. Not now. 
She had to trust this. It's being driven by a dog. She finished. Hartwell stared at her in dumb surprise, as though he was shocked to discover that she was, in fact, a lunatic after all. What's she going on about? Gibbs demanded crossly. Then the rumble of an engine crept through the thin glass of the window panes. It grew louder, drawing closer. Hartwell continued to stare at Lily, but his expression shifted, narrowing with intense interest. He stepped over to the window, opening the sash to see better than the dirt smearing the panes would allow. Cold air spilled into the room. A white lorry bounced down the lane. The rumble of the engine disturbed a murder of ravens scattered across the field. They startled up into the air, painted shadows flapping against the darkening sky. A few settled in the branches of the massive oak that dominated the yard. The driver's window of the truck was open. The head of a beagle protruded from it. The dog panted delightedly into the breeze, perched on the lap of his master, who let up the throttle as he slowed the vehicle and turned it into the drive. There was a crunch of gravel. Then the engine shuddered to a halt. Hartwell turned to Lily. How? he quietly demanded. How did you know? She didn't answer, holding fiercely to an ongoing thread of knowing deep inside of her. This was more than another bit of scrying. It was something else, something strange and yet utterly familiar, like an old friend come back to her doorstep. You have a collar, she told him. She reached, feeling for more, sensing it was there. Something about the temperature. There was a sharp knock on the door below, a quick exchange of voices. A few moments later, footsteps sounded in the hall. Lily recognised the man who arrived as the one who had been driving Hartwell's carriage the night before. He was tall and thin, good-looking in a dull sort of way. His chauffeur's cap was tucked into his trouser pocket. What is it, Mr Northcote? Hartwell demanded. Sorry to bother you, sir, but there's a gentleman below, Northcote replied. Says he's come about the boiler. Hartwell didn't answer. He just turned his gaze slowly back to Lily. Should I let him in, sir? Northcote pressed. This isn't a convenient time, Hartwell finally answered. See, I told him that. He said it'd be a fortnight before he was back out this way again, and I'm knowing the paint won't dry in this weather without any heat. That's a fortnight with no work being done about the place, and you've said you were on a schedule. Hartwell's irritation was written clearly on his face. Northcote seemed immune to it. The doctor snapped at Gibbs. Watch her. See she doesn't try anything foolish. He stalked out, Northcote following behind him. Lily let go. The tension of maintaining her deliberate connection with her power had been rising to a shrieking pitch. It broke, falling softly back, and she let out a long, shuddering breath. How had she done it? It had to be the drug. Though the vision had ended, some other effect still lingered. It had charged her like the battery in Estelle's magic lantern. There was no time now to consider what that meant, or worry about how long it might last. She needed to assess her options. She made a quick study of the room. Her eye lit on a narrow line in the wall. It was a door, no bigger than that of a cupboard. It had been papered over in the same pattern as the wall. Had the paper not been half-stripped, it would have been nearly invisible. She judged her chances of exploring it, while Gibbs watched from the doorway. She moved to the window. It was uncaged. Lily pushed up the sash. At least thirty feet extended between her and the hard, frozen ground. There was no way she could scale the smooth facade of the building. The great oak tree in the yard would be climbable, but the nearest branch was beyond her reach, even if she took the chance of leaping for it. An enormous raven perched on the bare limb, 
staring blandly out over the heath. Try that and you'll break your neck, Gibbs barked from within. The bird turned, eyes like black pebbles locked onto Lily's, measuring her with dark intelligence. What's the cleverest animal? Ravens. What do you have to pay them? More than you'd want to give. Sam's words came back to her, spoken in the drawing room of the refuge, while the portrait of St. Francis preaching to finches looked blandly on. Desperation choked her. She couldn't get out of this on her own. Strangford was gone. The grief of that hovered at the periphery, waiting for its time to consume her. But there were others. The bird outside the window ruffled its feathers, black eyes shining in the last of the evening light. The action that suggested itself to her was utterly ludicrous, the act of a woman who probably deserved to be locked up in an asylum. She did it anyway. There is a boy in Bloomsbury who talks to birds, Lily said. The blackbird on the oak turned, fixing her in its dark, unblinking stare. Lily refused to flinch from that penetrating, alien gaze. Tell him that I am here, that I need help. Please, whatever your price is, I will pay it. Just tell him... Her voice caught. She swallowed thickly, pressed on. Tell him that we are here. Oi, enough of that now. Get out of the bloody window. Gibbs snapped from within. The boy in Bloomsbury who talks to birds, Lily repeated urgently as the raven continued to gaze at her. Please! Rough hands grabbed her arms, pulling her inside. The glass slammed shut, hard enough to rattle the panes in their frames. Outside the window, startled black birds flapped into the air again, circling over the yard. All except for one, who continued to stare through the window, dark eyes glittering. Hartwell returned. With a glance, he took in Lily's position on the floor where Gibbs had tossed her. Put her back in her room, he commanded. Gibbs grabbed her arm, yanking her to her feet. Lily pulled against him, resisting, turning to Hartwell. Do we have a bargain? she called out. Gibbs tugged. Come on, you stupid bint. She dug her heels in, compelling Hartwell to answer her. Do we have a bargain? I am considering it, he snapped in reply. Gibbs tucked his shoulder into her stomach and lifted her. He hauled her down the hallway, his bones digging into her with every step, back to room 109, where he tossed her unceremoniously on the floor. The door slammed shut. It was heavy, closing with a solid clang. The lock thudded into place. Lily went to the window. The sun was nearly gone, the shadows thickening outside the steel-grated glass. She could barely see the dark form of the oak tree sprawling across the grand front lawn of the derelict estate. Its branches were empty. Gloom settled over the heath, the sun all but vanished behind the trees. Lily sat on the cold, bare floor, trying not to let the fear tear her to pieces. She had exposed herself, shared her most intimate secret with a monster hoping to wrest a promise from him to release Estelle. It was a promise he would certainly break. Her best hope was that she had sparked enough interest in him to divert his attention from Estelle for a little while, perhaps long enough for some form of help to arrive. Who was she fooling? Help wasn't arriving. Her only chance of that lay in a conversation with a bird, which had been decidedly one-sided. Hartwell would take Estelle's blood as soon as he found a compatible and trustworthy recipient. The delay of securing that might buy her a few days, but nothing more. Lily had been committed. As Mrs. Amanda Church, Hartwell could use her over and over again for as long as he liked, just as he had Mariah Resnick, and there were no oil lamps here.
The despair threatened to choke her, thick enough to make her dizzy. Her skin hummed, arms tingling with a low warning. They were coming. She knew it. Yet the knowledge meant nothing because there was nowhere she could run. Nowhere to hide. A moment later the door opened. Northcote and Gibbs came in. I'll need her coat removed. Hartwell's voice floated casually from the hall. The men grabbed her. Rough hands forced her onto her stomach on the floor. They tugged off her coat, her face grinding against the rough boards. She saw Hartwell's boots as he walked into the room. He set a black medical case down on the floor beside her, flipping the latches and opening it to reveal two rows of tidy glass jars and the long needle of a syringe. Hold her securely and give me her left arm, he ordered. Northcote pinned her legs. Gibbs tugged her right hand up against her back, then knelt on it, the pressure threatening to crack her ribs. He wrenched her left arm up, twisting it until her shoulder screamed. He held it steadily. Hartwell plucked one of the jars from his case. He screwed it onto the syringe. She felt his fingers on her arm. They were light, gentle. He unbuttoned and rolled back the sleeve of her shirt, pushing it up past her elbow. He took a rubber strap from the case and tied it around her triceps snugly, then tapped at the sensitive skin inside her elbow. You may feel a slight prick, he said, his tone as even and detached as it would be during some routine exam. The needle pierced her. The pain was small compared to the blazing tension in her shoulder, but it was constant. She felt the tip of the needle wiggle as Hartwell turned some lever on the syringe. He turned it back a moment later, and after another uncomfortable jiggle, he set the little vial down on the floor by her face. It was full of blood. He took a clean vial from the case, screwing it into place. Another twist of the lever. Her body screamed. Gibbs's knee crushed her fingers, her ribs aching. Her cheeks scraped against the cold floor. Another vial joined the first. A third left the case. Northcote shifted his weight on her legs and her knee twisted, sending pain shooting up her thigh. The needle wiggled in her arm. Finally, a third jar joined the others on the floor. That should be enough for testing, Hartwell announced, as though to some unseen audience hovering at the edge of the room. He tugged the needle neatly from her arm. She felt the pressure of his hand on the place where it had been. Hartwell neatly, carefully, wrapped a length of gauze around her arm. He secured it with a pin. Then he screwed lids onto each of the three vials, tightening them securely. They were labelled A. Church, Room 109. He set them neatly in their places in the medical case, then snapped it shut and stood. At some unseen sign the men let go. Lily rolled onto her side, then to her knees, hugging her aching arms to her chest. She didn't trust herself to stand, her legs tingling as the blood flowed back into them. See that she has something to eat. I don't want her weakened, Hartwell ordered. Then he left, taking the case with him. Northcote tipped his cap to her, as though apologizing for a mild inconvenience. Gibbs simply looked away, slamming the door shut behind him. She braced one foot against the floor, pushed, and staggered painfully to her feet. She was shaking but not with terror, though threads of that still lingered, wrapping cold fibres around her heart. It was rage. Pure, explosive rage. He would not get away with this. It didn't matter that she was locked away, alone, unarmed, with no hope of a rescue. She was unarmed, but she was not powerless. She had never been powerless. She reached inside, 
stretched herself fully and intentionally towards that strange instinct, the one that warned her when stairs were about to collapse or that danger was coming to the door. The same instinct that, years before, had always known when the housekeeper was going to knock a vase from the table, or that the tall, dashing earl who was her father was about to pay a call. The part of herself she had spent so much of her life trying to run from. The cold receded, and the pain. The walls of the room growing wider until they simply crumbled, dissolving into a space of unimaginable vastness. Lily stood in the heart of it. Knowledge hummed around her, inside of her. For decades, when she had felt that knowing, she had flinched away from it, tried to bury it as deep and far as possible. Knowing meant pain, meant a sense of responsibility she didn't feel capable of living up to. In the middle of the flowing crowd on Tottenham Court Road, Robert Ash had told her that there was more than one role she might play, that success and failure weren't always so black and white, that sometimes to simply stand up and fight was enough, no matter the outcome of the battle. She felt her power buzzing with life. This time, instead of running from it, she extended her mind to touch it. And it answered. 33. Lily sat in the center of the floor of the narrow room and waited. She held her connection to her power, focusing her mind and the stillness of her body on maintaining it. It was less than perfectly steady. She could feel it flicker, as though the lingering effect of the wine of Jerima was already beginning to fade. She would worry about that later. It was strong enough now for what she needed. There. Awareness hummed. Someone was coming. Lily rose. She stepped behind the door, pushing her back against the wall. Her timing needed to be perfect. A moment too soon or too late, and she would fail. She held herself silent and ready. Footsteps thudded down the hall. They stopped at her door. There was a heavy clang as the lock turned. The door began to open. Lily waited for a precise moment. Then, pressing her shoulders back against the wall, she lifted both of her legs and kicked with all her strength at the solid oak panel of the door. It slammed into Northcote, catching him on the shoulder and throwing him into the far side of the frame. The bowl he was carrying crashed to the floor and shattered. Lily didn't hesitate. If he had even a moment to recover, her chance would be lost. As soon as her feet returned to the floor, she grabbed him by the coat, extended her leg, and yanked him over it. He tripped, falling into the room. Lily kicked him swiftly in the gut. Northcote groaned, pulling his legs up to protect his middle from another blow. It didn't come. The reaction was enough to get him fully clear of the door. Lily leapt past him, grabbed the knob, and slammed it shut behind her. She threw the lock. The hallway was empty. Numbered doors marched in either direction, illuminated by the harsh electric light. She knew now why they seemed familiar. They reminded her of another hall, extending to an impossible distance, lined with infinite doors resonating with unimaginable potential. In her hand, she held the key the power to choose from infinite possibilities of what might be. The lingering hum of the vision shattered as Northcote began pounding violently on the door. She ran for the staircase. Halfway down the hall, the hum of awareness sang at her again. Someone was coming. She grabbed a knob and ducked through the nearest door, closing it carefully and quietly behind her. Footsteps pounded up the stairs, they hurried down the hallway, echoing past her hiding place. She waited until they had just begun to slow, then darted into the hall. Gibbs stood in front of the open door to room 109. Both he and Northcote turned, 
as she appeared and bolted for the stairs. She heard them come after her as she entered the landing. Every ounce of logic screamed to go down, a ground-floor door or window offering her best chance of escape. She hesitated. This wing was renovated and was intended to be part of an asylum. Though she wasn't sure how far along the repairs to the ground floor had gone, if it was anywhere near complete, there would be no way out down there. She thought back to the office Hartwell had claimed for himself. It had lain at the edges of the renovated wing of the building. Beyond it was the part of the old manor that faced the road, which she remembered looking entirely abandoned when she passed it on her ride a few weeks before. If she had a chance of escaping this place, that was where she would find it. She tore herself away from the desperate desire to descend and instead bolted up the staircase. She reached the top and raced past another procession of horribly regular doors. The painter's cloth still hung at the far end of the hall, as she remembered it. She could hear Gibbs and Northcote hit the hallway behind her, their feet thundering on the floorboards. She blasted past the cloth and found herself at the edge of a ballroom, shrouded in gloom and decay. There were no electric lights here. The high ceiling was hung with cobwebs and shadows. Mouse-eaten curtains trailed over the windows, pale squares on the wallpaper showing where paintings had once been displayed. It smelled of pigeon droppings and earth the space bare save for a pile of smashed wooden chairs in a corner. She didn't hesitate, sprinting into the room as the last rays of the setting sun faded against the filthy glass of the tall windows. On the far side, she slid into the mouth of a midnight dark hall. Doors lined it, leading into rooms of furniture shrouded in rotting dust cloths, wallpaper peeling like flayed skin, plaster bubbling and splitting along the ceilings. The hallway twisted and turned, branching unpredictably. Lily dodged along it blindly, making random turns, throwing herself deeper into the bowels of the ruin. She dashed down a once grand staircase, now draped with rotting shreds of an old carpet runner. Footsteps thundered behind her, coming closer. Knowing she was running out of hallway, she picked a room at random and dodged inside. Once, it must have been elegant. Now, only the crooked frame of a four-poster bed remained, stripped of mattress and hangings. The closet door was ajar, windows shuttered, save for one that hung precariously from its hinges. Nothing else. Nowhere she could hide, save for that closet itself, which was as good as a trap if anyone came to look and they would certainly look. She heard the steps slow, voices drifting to her down the short length of hallway that separated her from her pursuers. Which way did she go? Gibbs demanded. I don't know. I can't bloody see. Weren't you listening for her? I couldn't hear her over your blasted racket, Northcote snapped. She's in one of the rooms. Check them. Her heart pounded against her chest as she surveyed the room once more, panic growing. Where could she hide? The answer came to her. It was mad. It was also her only option. Taking a deep breath, willing herself to calm, she reached for her power once again. It was less steady than it had been back in room 109. Perhaps what she had done already had drained it. It felt more distant and ephemeral. Fear quickened. She forced it back. She could do this. She would do this. The connection settled, grew stronger. And she knew. What would come in a few moments was clearer to her than what had just passed, more real and substantial, complete to the last detail. She put her back to the wall beside the door, maintaining that awareness steadily. Then, as she had known he would, Gibbs entered the room. Now, instinct prompted her. She glided neatly, silently into place behind him, then took another half step to the right as he turned and looked at the place where she had been. Left. 
she moved. Gibbs swung around to pull back the door, peering into that darker corner of the room. As Lily watched, calmly, quietly, from behind him. Right again, forward. She was a shadow dancing in his wake, the knowledge of where he would go coming just a moment before he moved. That brief space was all the time she needed to choose her own reaction. Time it perfectly. A quick step to the side as he turned to examine the closet, ducking inside, slipping around him as he reversed and made his way back into the centre of the room. She knew when he would stop, knew that he would rub his hand along the back of his neck, as though sensing her eyes there. He would turn, abruptly, but she was already ahead of him, already moving to keep her body just out of his line of vision, so that all he saw, as he whirled, was the empty room. He studied it suspiciously, then muttered under his breath, Bloody ghost! As Lily watched him from the centre of the room he had just thoroughly searched, he walked away. The knowing flickered, sputtered. She felt the connection thin, then snap, worn through by the effort she had just demanded of it. She reached for it again, desperately. What answered her was only a fragment, an echo of what she had felt before. The sense of loss, sharp and painful, surprised her. Whatever shortcut she had taken to find that place inside herself was broken. To return there again, she would have to take the long road, the road Ash had described, made up of practice and training and discipline. But if she did choose that road, she had a hint, now, of what might be waiting for her at the end of it. Evangeline Ash's voice echoed through her mind. You have no idea what you are capable of. Discovering what she meant would have to wait. Right now, Lily needed to determine how she was going to get out of this place alive. She moved to the window and peered out the opening made by the half-fallen shutter. She had descended to the first floor. An ancient twisted wisteria vine climbed up the exterior of this side of the manor. She could reach the trunk of it from the window. It would offer easy means of scaling her way down to the leaf-strewn, cracked stones of the patio. From there, she could head for the road in hopes of flagging a passing automobile or carriage. There was also the farmhouse where she'd had her legs stitched up a few weeks before. She could run there and tell them to send for help, help that could come barreling through the doors to save Estelle. Except Estelle wouldn't be there any more. If Hartwell knew Lily had escaped, he would move his other research subject, or simply dispose of her before the authorities could arrive. They would find only a renowned physician in a half-renovated building, inconvenienced by a raving woman in trousers, who was at best a housebreaker, and at worst, an escaped lunatic, to be remanded back to Hartwell's care. No, she couldn't run. Not without Estelle. She thought back to the long, glaring hallways of doors. Estelle might be behind any one of them. She could hardly hope that Gibbs and Northcote would stay distracted in the ruined part of the manor long enough for her to try them all. And there was still Hartwell himself to consider. She didn't have time to guess where Estelle had been hidden. She needed to know. Her power wouldn't help her, even if she could manage to force a reconnection to it. There weren't any answers there. It couldn't tell her what was happening now, only what was coming. How could she know? The files. She thought back to the ones she'd rifled in Hartwell's study, all detailed, painstakingly organized. There had been a file cabinet in the office he'd commandeered here in the manor. It was far too new to be some relic of the old estate. Hartwell had brought it there before he'd moved so much as a stick of other furniture or supplies. Somewhere in that cabinet was a file on Estelle. It wouldn't list her true name, of course, but the rest of it would be perfectly accurate, including the number of the room where she was being held. 
Urgent footsteps echoed down through the ceiling as Lily made her way back to the ballroom. She slipped past the painter's cloth, returning to the glaring white hall of Hartwell's asylum. She paused to pluck a crowbar from the toolbox on the floor. The weight of it felt good in her hands, familiar, like an old friend. She crept up to the office door. It was empty. The electric lamp on the desk still lit the space, though outside the windows night had fully descended. The light felt harsh, exposing her to anyone who walked by. Her pulse pounding, she strode to the big steel file cabinet, wedging the crowbar into the edge of the first drawer and throwing all her weight against it. The drawer cracked open with a squeal of twisting metal. It was empty. She slammed it shut, knowing speed was what counted now, and jammed the crowbar into the next drawer. It popped open, then caught. Lily stomped on the crowbar and the drawer wrenched free. A handful of files rested inside. She grabbed them and tossed them onto the desk, quickly flipping through the contents. First was a 75-year-old female from Islington, diagnosed with dementia. Next was a 20-year-old with melancholia. There were no room numbers on either file, making these most likely patients that Hartwell had already arranged to take up residence in this sterile hell once it was ready to open. She tossed them aside, knowing it could not possibly be long before she was discovered. She opened the file of a female, age unknown, but described as middling, approximately five feet ten inches in height, diagnosed with chronic delusions. Sapphic, Hartwell had neatly penned on one of the lines. Sapphist. The slur he had used to refer to Estelle. On the opening line of the chart was a room number. 204. There! The shout came from the hall. Lily looked up to see Hartwell and Northcote striding toward her. She snatched up the crowbar. Could she fight them both? The door in the wall caught her eye. She ran to it and wrenched it open. A narrow stair lay behind, leading up. As Hartwell entered the room, she bolted through that dark opening. Shouts echoed up at her as she climbed. The stairwell was tight, twisting and turning dizzily. Cobwebs brushed her face as she ran, her feet slipping in the dust. She didn't allow herself to wonder what could possibly be at the end of it. She simply ran until a solid wall stopped her. She felt at it frantically in the darkness. Cold air seeped through cracks in the wood. Her hand brushed a knob. She rattled it, but it refused to turn. Footsteps from below shook the boards under her feet. The wall behind her was rough, not wood, but brick. She braced herself against it, then kicked. Once. Twice. The third time, something shattered and the door swung open. Lily ran through it out into a narrow path that stretched across the apex of the roof. The sky overhead exploded with stars, dizzying in their abundance. The cold air slapped her, fogging her breath. She could see the road and beyond it, the broad expanse of the heath, the familiar landscape made strange by a shroud of winter. Around her, the peaks and gables of the house were a treacherous mountain range, blanketed with snow. She could see the two great wings of the building, but there was no sign of another door like the one behind her, or any promise of a way down that didn't involve tumbling to her death. Voices sounded from the stairwell. Out of alternatives, she ran out along the narrow frosted path. It ended at the solid brick wall of another chimney. She turned, letting the crowbar hang at her side. Hartwell stepped out onto the roof. If you will wait a moment, Mr. Northcote. He spoke into the darkness behind him. Then he turned to Lily. Miss Albright. Dr. Hartwell. His face looked cadaverous in the pale light of the stars, the hollows of his cheeks cast into sunken shadows. 
His tone was casual, as though he had simply happened across her here on the peak of the roof. You have noted, I am sure, that there is no other means of egress from here, he said. Lily didn't answer, adjusting her grip on the crowbar. Her fingers were cold, the metal sucking the warmth from her hand. Mr. Northcote is fairly cross with you, he continued. I gather Mr. Gibbs's as well, but I have made both of them promise not to exact any retribution for the trouble you caused them this evening, if you agree to return quietly to your room. I'm sure you must see this is the only sensible course of action. There was nothing sensible about it. To return to the room was to put herself back under Hartwell's control. He would take what he wanted from her, quickly or slowly, and then he would kill her. The snow-covered roof offered nothing. No scaffolding she could scale back to the ground, no convenient tree she could climb. There was only a steep, slippery pitch to either side of her, and beyond that, a long drop to the dirt. The silence where her answer should have been stretched grew undeniable. I see, Hartwell replied shortly. That is unfortunate. He called back to the door. Mr. Northcote, I am afraid Miss Albright will need to be retrieved. Hartwell moved a step to the side, and Northcote slipped past him onto the path. Can you handle it? She heard Hartwell ask, voice low. She's just a girl, Northcote retorted. He approached, moving cautiously down the narrow walk. As he came, Lily heard a thick fluttering overhead. She looked up to see a wave of black wings pass across the sky, dark bodies obscuring the thick veil of stars. The ravens circled, a few breaking away from the others and coming to rest on the cracked pots crowning the chimney behind her. They stared down at her and Northcote, black eyes indifferent. The driver continued to stalk toward her. He was a large man. She had no illusions about her chances of resisting him if he managed to get his hands on her. At the moment, she had only one advantage. She took a step out from the bricks, the crowbar hanging in the shadow of her leg. As Northcote reached the place where she waited for him, the silence of the night broke, interrupted by the distant rumble of an engine. Beyond Northcote's shoulder, a pair of headlights pierced the darkness of the heath, moving far faster than they ought to be up the snow-covered road. He turned toward the sound, surprised. Lily seized her chance and swung. She aimed the crowbar for the driver's back, his broadest target. The impact sent him lurching forward, but he turned as he fell and clutched at the sleeve of Lily's jacket. Northcote's weight pulled her off balance. Her feet slid on the snow-covered path, and she tumbled after him, sliding down the icy slates of the roof. She swung the crowbar up over her head, wildly. The hook of it slammed into the path, and held, wedged in place. She dangled from the end, feet hanging halfway down the roof, as Northcote slid past her. He stopped at the copper gutter, clinging to it. The metal creaked. Doctor! He shouted. The rumble of the approaching engine grew louder. The headlights were drawing closer to the drive, their glow illuminating the shadowy forms of another handful of ravens, settling on the hedge that lined the road. Miss Albright? Lily looked up to see Hartwell standing over her. He knelt down in the snow, extending his arm. Take my hand, please. Behind her, a louder wrench signaled another shift in the gutter. Northcote screamed. Lily glanced down at him. He had managed to wrap one of his legs around the metal, but the copper pulled away from the roof, revealing a few inches of open air. We can fetch a rope for Mr. Northcote once you're somewhere safe, 
Hartwell added. His voice was calm, placidly reassuring. His pale hand remained suspended in the darkness above her as the cold iron of the crowbar grew slick under her sweating palms. She was under no illusion as to why he offered her his help. He wanted her body. He wanted to rip it open and find the source of its power. He would tear it out of her and make it his, acting out some dark dream of possession cloaked in altruistic glitter. Below her, metal screamed and twisted as the gutter tore away from the roof. Northcote's voice rose to join it, a howl of animal fear as he slid down the remaining length of it and then tumbled from view. The howl ended abruptly with a dull crunch in the snow of the yard. Hartwell's hand hovered in the darkness above. She felt the tension between two terrible options, to fall or to let Hartwell save her and be placed fully under his power for whatever remained of her life. Her hands slid against the cold iron of the crowbar and her mind flashed back to a hallway of infinite doors, to the cold weight of a key in her hand. The connection to that space became present, firing through her. With perfect clarity, she knew exactly what it was. The future spilled forward from the moment in which she hung. She felt it splinter, multiplying like a kaleidoscope in which every facet revealed something subtly different. Possibilities unfurled behind countless doors. Lily knew them all, saw the myriad ways they could unfold, based on the pivot of this moment. In many, nearly all, Hartwell continued his work. More women died in the name of his research, research with the potential of proving that desirable talents could be harvested with the blood of those who bore them, then granted to others deemed more worthy. It was a discovery that would justify unspeakable horrors. And yet, there were other doors, slimmer, less tangible, which led to a very different outcome. She was suffused with the knowledge that, at this precise minute, she held the key to one such future in her hand, a third option that lay between letting go and giving in. One where she took Hartwell down with her. She could become a murderer herself, and in doing so, prevent a thousand untold murders from ever being thought. It was a choice that chilled her with horror. Lily pulled against the crowbar. She walked her feet up the icy slope of the roof, bracing them against the slates. She took her right hand from the iron and lifted it, felt Hartwell's cold palm clasp her own, his grip sure, and prepared to use that leverage to push both herself and the man who thought he was going to save her off into the open air. At the top of the drive, the headlights swung towards the great ruined house. Tires skidded across the snow, caught and spun a gleaming silver Rolls Royce into the yard. The light from below washed over Hartwell, chasing the shadows from his face, leaving him exposed and thoroughly surprised. On the chimney pot, a raven ruffled its wings and croaked. Impossible. It was impossible. But impossible things had been happening all night. They'd been happening all her life. Hartwell turned his gaze from the vehicle in the drive to Lily's face, surprise shifting to suspicion, run through with veins of something else. A reluctant respect. His hand in hers, her legs still braced against the roof. Lily met his eyes. She felt the perfect balance of the moment. The decision was hers to make, but only for another breath. Down in the drive, doors slammed, the engine rumbling to a stop. She exhaled 
and then, shifting the angle of her feet against the roof, allowed Hartwell to haul her back to the path. Voices called out below, sharp and urgent. Lily singled out a familiar Ulster brogue as Dr. Gardner's tones floated up to where she stood on the peak of the roof. There's a man on the ground over here. Hartwell still held her arm, keeping her as close as a lover as he looked down at the activity below. Figures moved across the headlights of the rolls, their forms thrown into silhouette. Lily could see Gardner's broad shoulders as he pulled a case from the automobile, then jogged over to where something lay beyond her line of sight. Sam grabbed a lantern and ran to the end of the drive, where he waved it at three more sets of approaching headlights, making their way across the heath at a more measured pace. Someone else remained in front of the vehicle, his gaze directed up at the roof. Though he was cast into shadow by the headlamps, Lily knew him. She knew his shape, the set of his shoulders, the unfashionable fall of his hair. Stringford, alive, here. The relief shattered over her, bursting into a thousand pieces, releasing her from a grief so deep she hadn't allowed herself to feel it. She felt his eyes on her and knew he had made her out on the peak of the roof, along with the silhouette of the man who gripped her. He ran, sprinting toward the house. How did you do it? Hartwell demanded. How did you tell them where to find you? I had help, Lily replied. The other motor cars had reached the drive. They turned, carefully negotiating the snow-covered corner to enter the estate. Lily could see the decals of the Metropolitan Police painted onto the sides. They stopped and uniformed men spilled out, heading for the house or to the place where Northcote had fallen. Beside her, Hartwell watched them come. I think this can be salvaged he said thoughtfully, slowly. There was a thin current of fear in his tone, a flicker of uncertainty. It shocked Lily. He had always seemed sure, certain of himself and the rightness of his actions. She felt her pulse quicken, her senses sharpening. The sapphist has been drugged, he continued. She won't recall anything of substance. There is nothing in the building that should not be here given its intended purpose. Gibbs will validate any case I make. There is only Northcote who must be accounted for. I think you're forgetting something, Lily snapped. No, I am merely envisioning the picture that will be made if the most troublesome piece of the puzzle is eliminated. Her heart pounded. She did not need any power to understand what was coming next. It would be a neat enough story. The good doctor would simply be trying to do what was right for the lunatic who had been witnessed breaking into his house. A lunatic who was now on the roof from which his loyal servant had fallen. Even if Strangford and the others tried to speak the truth, it would look groundless without the key witness in all of this without Lily. On the chimney, the raven called again, another harsh, demanding croak, a restless flap of dark wings. She felt the pressure on her arm shift. There was no time to think, no time to weigh outcomes. Lily acted on instinct, countering him with the only resource she had available. She grabbed his arms in return, and when she felt him push, threw the weight of her body toward the yard. They toppled together from the path. She hit the snow-covered slates, sliding. She pushed Hartwell away and reached out wildly. Her fingers clasped cold iron. She grabbed, the metal scraping against her palm. Her momentum jerked to a stop, her shoulder screaming in protest. Beside her, Hartwell glided across the icy slates. He reached the bottom of the roof where the gutter had torn away, and without so much as a gasp, 
tipped over the edge and vanished. Lily dangled from the far end of the crowbar, her hand burning, and watched him go. There was no scream, only silence. Then the thick crunch of impact. The raven rose from the chimney, flapping lazy black wings. It circled over her, then swooped down to the place where Hartwell had fallen. Cold metal slipped under her palm. Lily. She looked up. Strangford knelt on the path. There were cobwebs in his dark hair, his pale cheek marred by the scar of his struggle with Waddington. He tugged at the black gloves on his hands, shoved them into his pocket. He reached across the roof to her. Hold on to me, he said. She felt her precarious grasp on the crowbar slip. She kicked her feet against the snow covering the slates, searching for purchase, and found it. Hardly anything, just the toe of her motorcycle boot catching against a chip in the stone. But she used it, wedged in as far as she could, and pushed. She swung her hand up, met Strangford's bare fingers, and clutched. He brought his other hand down to catch her, his grip warm and sure. He pulled. Lily scrambled, and a few slippery, precarious steps later, he hauled her back onto the path. His arms came around her, solid and real. She let herself fall into his embrace, all the tension and fear crumbling, leaving her raw, vulnerable to the horror of how close she had come to losing herself. Strangford, she said, her voice as hoarse as the raven. I know, he whispered, his breath warm against her hair, his bare hands cradling her. I know. Thirty-four. One week later, East Sussex. The air was warm, a balmy spring breeze sharp with the scent of the sea. Lily stepped down from the express train, crossing the platform at the quaint coastal town of Hastings. The steam whistle blew. She wove her way through a light, busy crowd, stopping at the baggage car. She handed over her ticket. The boy who took it, paused only a moment to gape at her driving coat and trousers before he disappeared into the darkness of the car. He emerged a moment later, wheeling her triumph. Lily grabbed the handlebars, helping him bounce it down the steps onto the platform. A few waiting passengers stared as she pushed it down the ramp. The road before the station was busy, bustling with shoppers or couples walking arm in arm through the warm spring afternoon. Ladies clad in soft pastel gowns showed off their straw bonnets. Crocuses bloomed in the window boxes, and the air smelled of the fresh salt of the shore. She swung her leg over the motorcycle, hopped onto the pedals, and spun. The engine caught, roaring to life. A few startled gazes turned her way as she opened the throttle and shot up the road. Out in the country... The grass was turning a verdant spring green in the fields, the few remaining patches of snow quickly melting. Sheep grazed contentedly while hens pecked at the side of the road. Between the budding hedgerows, Lily caught glimpses of the broad blue sea to the south. The landscape grew wilder as she turned inland toward the weald. Stretches of forest intermingled with the fields, hills rising around her, as the triumph rattled over a wooden bridge, she caught a glimpse of a torrid little waterfall spilling down into a narrow stream. She turned at an ancient gatehouse. The drive was long, covered in neatly combed gravel and sheltered by a row of massive lime trees. Their regular trunks marched by as she flew along, slowing only when she had reached the yard. She turned to stop in front of a rambling but elegant Jacobian manor, an assortment of grey wings and towers nestled at the edge of a wood. Breed Abbey, the Torrington family seat. 
A still, shining pond reflected the ivy-covered walls. The green lawn was scattered with ancient trees, their roots circled with white and purple blossoms. She could see sheep grazing, a pair of gardeners raking a path. An ancient church sat just beyond the house, a relic of the monastery from which the place took its name. She killed the engine, and quiet settled back over the landscape. It was beautiful, her father's home, this place that she had never seen before. She kicked down the stand of the motorbike and dismounted, tugging off her goggles. At the front door, she hesitated only a moment before lifting her hand and knocking firmly. It opened. A butler dressed in a pristine black suit stood in the entry. He was at least seventy. His frame had likely once been impressive, but was starting to bow with age. He took in her appearance with only the briefest glance eyes flickering over her fitted trousers, wind-tossed hair, and the triumph parked on the drive behind her. Then, with perfect courtesy, he greeted her. Good afternoon. Miss Lily Albright, to see his lordship, Lily announced, handing him her card. Very good, miss, the butler replied, accepting it without missing a beat. I shall see if he is in. He opened the door, motioning Lily into the entry. She felt her own unexpected note of surprise, some part of her anticipating that she would be left waiting on the step. Obviously, the staff of Breed Abbey had been trained to offer courtesy no matter who called at the front door. If you'll wait here, he said. Lily nodded, and the butler made his way down the hall. He walked slowly, favoring one of his knees. She waited in the entry. The ceiling was high, paneled in rich, dark wood, as were the walls, carved in elegant patterns glowing with years of polish. The furnishings were a mix of old and new, an ancient tapestry on the walls hanging dangerously close to a propped-up cricket bat and a pair of extraordinarily muddy shoes. A grand Tudor chair embroidered upholstery faded with years, held a woman's feathered hat and veil alongside a set of pale lavender gloves. Someone had left a copy of Herodotus on the table next to the silver salver for calling cards. It was one of her younger brothers, most likely, the brothers she had never met. The hat was a relic of their mother, the Countess, her father's wife. At the end of the room, an enormous clock ticked steadily, then struck a rich, resonant one. The butler returned. Apologies for the delay, he said. His lordship is in the study. May I take your coat? That won't be necessary, Lily returned. I won't be staying very long. She followed him down the hall, past large, elegant rooms, that spoke of generations of history and the influence of a woman's particular eye. The combination could have been jarring, but wasn't. Instead, the house felt lived in, real. She could too easily imagine reading a book while curled into the brown armchair next to the drawing room fireplace, or racing a set of unruly boys down the grand central staircase. She forced the images away, locking them out. The butler stepped through an open door. Miss Albright, my lord, he announced as she followed him in. Thank you, Mr. Manning, her father replied, his voice as rich and resonant as the toll of a great bell. Mr. Manning bowed and showed himself out, leaving her alone with the earl. The study was large. A row of tall windows looked across the east lawn, she could imagine the room must be exceptionally bright and warm in the mornings, an inference confirmed by the empty fireplace at her back. The walls were covered in more rich wood, lined with bookshelves. The volumes that filled them were obviously there for reference, not for show. There were well-thumbed books on law, history, agriculture and finance, beside tomes on philosophy and a complete collection of the works of Shakespeare. 
A grand old desk held court in the centre of the room. It was comfortably cluttered with stacks of papers, a half-finished cup of tea, and a scattering of photographs in elegant little brass frames. She glimpsed the faces of a pair of mischievous young boys beside a pale-haired woman in an elegant gown. Lord Torrington stood at the desk, clad in a tweed jacket with patches on the elbows, his feet tucked into a pair of loafers that looked well broken in. The light from the windows brightened the thick silver of his hair. Would you like tea? he asked. No, thank you. A silence stretched across the room. How is Lord Deverell? Lily inquired. Cleared of all charges. Thanks to you. That was Mr. Ash's doing, not mine. After Lily had told Strangford and the others the whole of how Hartwell and Waddington had managed their crimes, Ash had said simply that he would see to the details. The details had turned out to be coordinating with law enforcement to confirm that a man matching Waddington's description had been admitted to the location of each of the murders, claiming to have come from the gasworks. Of course, the gasworks had no record of any leak or of dispatching an inspector. When a search of Waddington's flat revealed a case of syringes and rubber tubing, any lingering doubt about the matter had been put firmly to rest, in time for Deverell to be quietly cleared. As for Hartwell, the world believed he had leapt from the roof of his asylum out of the shame of discovering he had been unwittingly harbouring a murderer among his staff. His true part in the affair remained known to only a few. It didn't matter. He was dead. You undervalue your role, Lord Torrington countered. He moved from behind the desk and paced to the window. He seemed uncomfortable, an emotion Lily suspected was rather rare for him. You should not have had to come here, he said, looking out over the lawn. The words stung. They shouldn't have. It was hardly a surprise that he thought that way. Lily shrugged, refusing to let it show. I knew it would be safe. Safe, he echoed. That your wife would be out. He stared at her as though shocked by her words. Lily pressed on, forcing a casual tone. You always came to us on Wednesdays. To my mother because that was when the Countess made her social calls. You misunderstand. He stopped, looking down. When he raised his head again, the lines on his face seemed deeper, as if he had grown older in that moment. What I meant is that this visit should not have been necessary, because I should have come to you. To thank you for what you did. And to apologize. His words left her feeling even more unsettled, as though the ground were threatening to shift beneath her feet. There's no need for that. She looked away, hiding herself in a study of the Arcadian landscape beyond the glass. You came to me for help, and I did not give it to you. That choice put you in the path of a great deal of harm. No, Lily snapped in reply. It was my own choice that did that, not yours. He moved to the chair and dropped into it. I am arguing with myself, he muttered. Something lurched in her chest. She ignored it. Turning to him, she cut to the core of the reason she had come. I know about the memo. The one Hartwell wrote to the war office. The one you were copied on. She waited for the impact of her revelation, of the accusation it implied. You read it? He asked quietly. I read the reply acknowledging receipt, saying how very interested the office was in the outcome of Hartwell's research. The questions burned against her lips, demanding to be asked. How much had he known? How much had he condoned? She kept them close. She would wait and see how he rose to the challenge she had thrown at him. 
He stood and joined her by the window. A war is coming, he said from beside her. The light shifted, a cloud momentarily obscuring the clear spring sunlight, casting its shadow across the idyllic landscape beyond the glass. Perhaps with Germany, though it might just as easily be Russia, or even the Ottomans. It will be great, unlike anything we have fought before. More brutal, more terrible. There is no avoiding it, not by any possible scenario I have reckoned. He glanced over at her. But perhaps you already knew that. Lily remembered what she had seen. The vision of crouching in a hole cut into the cold, muddy ground, braced with wood and barbed wire. The shaking, ear-splitting impact of artillery shells. How the world had exploded. Strangford torn from her in a blast of dirt and splinters. A war. England will need every advantage she can muster to come out of it intact, he said, his voice low but steady. We cannot afford to turn our backs on any option, no matter how far-fetched it might seem. No matter what it costs. No, he replied clearly, firmly. Cost must be considered. That is what keeps us from becoming monsters. And what Hartwell's research would have cost? The lives of a few women? He looked at her, his grey eyes, so very like her own, shot through with regret. I didn't know. None of us knew. God help me, I thought he was a gentleman. Oh, he was a gentleman, Lily retorted. She felt the blow hit as it had been intended to. He went quiet beside her, the stillness stretching between them, tense as a bowstring. It would seem that I am perpetually failing you, he said. Her throat caught. She looked away. Outside, the clouds shifted once more, light dancing across the spring green fields. The question that had been burning inside of her finally forced its way to her lips, spilled out into the room. Did you want me here? she asked. After my mother died? Yes, he replied simply. I wanted that very much. She felt the impact of the words. They hit with all the force of an artillery shell, shattering something inside of her. But you sent me away, she quietly protested. I had a duty to my family. To your family, Lily echoed numbly. Of course. When he spoke again, his voice was rougher than it had been, more uneven. How could this have ever been your home if they would not welcome you? If I'd brought you here in spite of them, you would always have been an outsider. Sending me away didn't change that. He pressed his hand to the glass, his shoulders bowing. God help me, but I have made a mess of things. I wronged you, Lily. I wronged my wife, my children. And yet I cannot regret it. Not for a moment. She felt exposed, her senses sparking. Sensitive to the point of pain. Part of her wanted to stop right here, walk away before the conversation could go any further, reveal more of what she both wanted and was desperately afraid to know. Her own voice had grown rough. Because you loved her. He looked at her, the grief written on his face. Because I loved both of you. A spring shower burst over the great green lawn. The raindrops pelted against the small spring leaves, rattled against the window panes. It was the sort of storm that would pass quickly, leaving newness in its wake. He cleared his throat, moving over to his desk, rearranging some of the papers. I am returning to London next week, Tuesday at the latest. 
Perhaps we could. His voice caught, halted. She felt the space left by those unspoken words, that sudden, aching vulnerability reaching across the room. She burst out, the words spilling from her, sounding as raw as they felt. I won't be anyone's secret. The quick downpour rattled against the glass, tapping impatient fingers as he looked at her from across the desk. No, he said firmly at last. Never be that. The rain passed, fading into a spare few drops dancing on the wet blades of grass. Her answer to the question he had not quite asked should have been harder to give. It should have involved more of a struggle within herself. But something had changed. Then perhaps we could, she replied quietly. The coachman was wheeling the triumph up from the garage as she stepped out the front door, the full freshness of spring after rain enveloping her. He stopped at the foot of the stairs and held the motorbike ready with a posture she suspected was nearly identical to the one he used to help dowagers into their daimlers. She climbed on, ignited the engine, and roared down the lime-lined drive of the estate. The air smelled of new mud, forest, and the sea, the wind tossing the loose tendrils of her hair. She flew across the weald, knowing that something fundamental had shifted, like a curtain thrown open on a view she had not known existed. She throttled the triumph up to speed and laughed. Thirty-five. The light was turning golden over Bedford Square, casting a warm glow over the residents who strolled along the pavement or stood chatting on the bright green grass of the park. Lily stopped the triumph next to the wrought iron fence that lined the narrow front garden of her destination. She should have come sooner. She knew that. She also knew that the inhabitants of the building before her were better equipped than anyone to understand why she hadn't. No one here would judge her for needing time and space to come to terms with all that she had learned. All that she had done. She leaned the motorcycle against the rails and climbed the steps. Automatically, she lifted her hand to rap on the rich blue paint of the door, then hesitated. Her eyes drifted to the small brass plaque mounted by the entrance, engraved with a series of Chinese characters. She couldn't read them. She didn't have to. She knew what they said. Instead of knocking, she lowered her hand to the knob. She turned it, and the door swung open. Lily stepped into the hall. It was empty and quiet. The Ming vase stood on the narrow table in the entry, the orange goldfish swimming busily among a field of blue lotus blossoms. Beside it, the bust of Sir Isaac Newton watched her impassively. A burst of bright, familiar laughter rang from the door to her right. Drawn toward it, Lily stepped into the library. Estelle reclined in one of the armchairs. She was draped in her peacock blue caftan, a light gauze bandage wrapped around her throat. The rich hues of her turban stood out boldly against the subdued colours of the books that surrounded her. She held a cup and saucer in her hands. As Lily entered, she took a break from laughing to sip her tea. It is not the least bit funny. Ken Cross countered from the chair across from her. Of course it is, Estelle retorted. You mustn't mind her, Mr. Ken Cross, Miss Bard cut in. She stood on the far side of the room, plucking a volume on Polynesian religions from the shelf. She gets a bit giddy after her third cup of Darjeeling. This has nothing to do with tea and everything to do with envisioning James in his knickers facing down an angry hippopotamus, Estelle replied. They're extremely dangerous animals, Ken Cross protested, especially when one's rifle is back on the beach with one's trousers. 
Estelle snorted from behind her teacup. It struck Lily how impossible this moment should have been. Only a few weeks before she would have believed, known beyond doubt, that this woman would be dead, lying cold in her grave. Instead, she sat here, in the warmth of the library, mercilessly teasing Cancross and eliciting a wry little twitch of Miss Bard's lips. It was not that Lily had been mistaken from the start about the import of her vision. That foresight of Estelle bleeding, pointing an accusing hand at some unseen threat, had meant her death. She knew that with a certainty that went beyond logic to some place bone deep and undeniable. Between the vision and the moment the events it foretold came to pass in the world, something had changed. The context had shifted turning a nightmarish end into the slimmest possibility of hope. Because of Lily. Because of the choice she made and the chances she took to achieve it. What if changing the future was never the point? It was the question Robert Ash had posed to her in the middle of Tottenham Court Road. She thought of the painting upstairs, the powerful images drawn through the gift of a woman who had died years before she was born, of doors and keys and infinite possibilities. Lily didn't know what her purpose was meant to be, but perhaps, just possibly, she was starting to guess. Mess all bright, Ken Cross called, spying her in the doorway. I see you've been riding, and a lovely afternoon for it. Hello, Mr. Cancross. Is Mr. Ash in? He's off humming to himself, Estelle said, waving her hand dismissively. Meditating in the sanctuary, Cancross corrected. You may wait here with us, if you like, though I'm sure he would not mind if you joined him. Thank you. She left, another burst of cheerful laughter following her out. At the end of the hall, she paused to pull off her boots, setting them down next to a pair of worn but well-polished brogues on the mat by the door. Then she slipped through the dark curtain into the quiet stillness of the sanctuary. Silence blanketed the dimly lit space. The air was cool, smelling of old wood and fresh water. Ash, clad in a dark suit, sat in the centre of the floor, Legs crossed, his hands resting gracefully on his knees. Lily lowered herself to the ground beside him, folding her body into a similar position. She waited. Her pulse was pounding. It was hard to remain still, to simply sit there while Ash continued to meditate. She resisted the urge to twitch or tap her finger, ordering her body to submit to the notion of staying quiet for a few minutes. The stillness settled around her. Her breath deepened, instinctively trying to take in more of that fresh, cool air. Something inside of her shifted, the racing of both her thoughts and her heart beginning to settle. The cause of her restlessness rose to the surface, revealed itself. She was afraid. She had no rational reason to be, Ash had already answered the question she wanted to ask him weeks ago. Yet so much had changed since then. So much more was riding on what he said, the shape her life would take from this moment on. Exposed, the fear lost some of its edge. It became another facet of the room, no more threatening than the wooden beams or the water running through the channel in the floor. Her leg tingled starting to cramp. She resisted for a few moments, then finally grimaced and, as slowly as possible, unfolded it and stretched it out in front of her. How have you been, Miss Albright? Ash asked. From anyone else, it would have been just a common courtesy, demanding a rote response. Not with Ash. Lily knew the inquiry was genuine, and invited the truth in response. I'm fine, she assured him. Really.
Do not be surprised if it comes back to you, in bad dreams or a feeling of panic that comes over you when you have no reason to expect it. You have been through an extraordinary trial. It takes time for both your body and your mind to recover from such an experience. He spoke with a clear, simple certainty, and Lily found herself wondering if he'd won that knowledge himself the hard way. Her thoughts fell back to the vision, to the conversation she'd had with Evangeline Ash as she stood in the attic of this house. That exchange had not been a vision of the future, nor an echo of the past, but something else, something she suspected had nothing to do with her own power, but had been born instead in something she didn't understand and perhaps never would. Should she tell him? She considered it, aware of Ash's presence beside her. No. She suspected that wound was still raw, no matter that it was thirty years old. He didn't need her reopening it. Besides, the message had been for her, and it had been received. That was why she was here. May I ask you something? She said. Please, Ash invited calmly. When I came here before, you made an offer. You said you would help me learn more about what I am, what I can do, what that means. Does that offer still stand? Yes, Miss Albright, he replied. It stands. She took a deep breath, an attempt to let the calming atmosphere of the room settle the rapid fluttering of her nerves. Then I accept. The words were ordinary, but she felt their weight, the significance of the commitment they entailed. Once, that had seemed impossible, even terrifying. Now it was as clear as anything in her life had ever been. She would learn. It would be hard, full of challenges and frustrations. But she would do it, because to do otherwise would be to deny who she was. She was done with that, forever. She thought of everything she had done in those last weeks, the visions, the powers that had manifested in the house on the heath. They were faded now, only the faintest echo of what they had been. It didn't matter. Lily knew there was more where that came from, things she couldn't even guess at yet. It would take work to get there, a great deal of work but she would come to know all of it eventually. The thought was both terrifying and exhilarating. When do we start? she asked. Ash considered. Tomorrow morning, six o'clock. Lily laughed. Six o'clock? Do I need to be presentable? Not in the least. She hesitated, trying to think of the right thing to say. All that came to mind was the most obvious phrase. She just hoped he understood quite how much it meant. Thank you. You are very welcome, Miss Albright, he replied. Outside the sanctuary, she tugged on her boots, then stopped, letting out a long breath. She had done it, taken the first step. It felt far bigger than a few words exchanged in a dark, quiet room. Her senses tingled with excitement, her adrenaline flowing. She felt like she should be running or shouting something from a rooftop. A clatter sounded from the far end of the hall, followed by the mingling of quick voices. Lily followed the sound down the stairs to the kitchen and stepped inside. It was warm. The windows fogged with steam from the stove. The air smelled sweet and savory, of steamed rice and ginger. Mrs. Lou clanged pans in the sink, running the tap. A man with graying hair sat at the table, a pouch of gardener's tools tied to his waist. He sipped a cup of tea, a plate of biscuits and a newspaper covered in Chinese characters resting in front of him. Sam approached the stove, plucking the lid from one of the pots simmering there. Ting Shalai! Mrs. Lu snapped at him in Mandarin, 
wrapping his hand with a wooden spoon. Like her, Xiao Sheng. The man at the table cut in quietly, his words addressed to Sam. Sam looked over to see Lily standing in the doorway. He nodded toward the pot. She's got lotus seed buns in there. I can take one out without losing all the steam, none I, he promised Mrs. Liu. Three more minutes, Mrs. Liu retorted. Have you met my father? Sam said, moving to the table. Bah, this is Miss Albright. Very pleased to meet you, the gardener said in careful English, turning the page of his newspaper. Come on, this way. Sam pulled Lily through a narrow door into the pantry. He hopped onto a stool and pulled a package wrapped in waxed paper from the top shelf. He unfolded the paper to reveal a box neatly packed with some confection. He plucked one from inside and tossed it into his mouth, then offered the box to Lily. Sugar melon, he said, through a bit of chewing. They're delicious. I'm sure they are. She paused, then pushed forward. Sam, there's something I want to ask you. You're wondering about the ravens. He asked it as casually as he had offered the candy, sucking a stray bit of sugar from his finger. She felt as though the shadow of a dark wing passed over the room. So it's true, she confirmed. That's how you knew where to find me. He popped another treat into his mouth, then shuffled the neat rose in the box to hide the missing pieces. He rewrapped it and tucked it back onto the shelf. I just nipped out for a smoke when that big blighter came up on me. He waited till I had the match in my hand to start croaking, he said. Near burned myself. Can't say how it might have gone had he turned up any later. His lordship was ready to take down Artwell's door, pull off the gloves and start reading everything in the house, with me and the doctor set to beat off the peelers when they came to carry him off, which would have gone swimmingly, I'm sure. He crossed his legs, leaning back against a shelf packed with jars of pickles, and looked away. To be fair, I wasn't that far behind him. His admission of concern tugged at something deep in her chest, as did his revelation about Strangford's state while she was missing. Thank you. He shrugged. Anyway, you needn't worry about it, he assured her. The ravens, I mean. You're all settled there. She felt a chill. You mean they don't want me to pay? Oh, no, he countered. Never that. But it's usually just one eye they ask for. You gave him four. She thought of Northcote's scream as the gutter ripped away and he plunged to the ground. The scrape of Hartwell's body against the snow as he slid across the slates. And before that, an officer dropping to the ground with a nail through his skull. Three men sent to their deaths by her hand. Each time, she had acted to save herself from the same fate or something even worse. She knew that to be true, and yet the thought of those satisfied ravens set ice into her bones. Sam pulled off his cap, scratching the back of his neck. They're happy enough with how it all came out, he added. Said to let him know if you wanted to work with them again. I see. She reached out, setting her hand on his arm. Thank you for being there to hear them. He shrugged. Weren't nothing. It was quite a bit more than that. She countered quietly. She moved to the door. Sam's voice stopped her. He's out in the garden, if you were wondering. Tension quickened inside of her, set her pulse fluttering. She looked back. Who would that be? Who do you think? He retorted, plucking an apple from a basket tossing it into the air and neatly catching it. She stopped in the hallway. To one side lay the front door and beyond it her triumph and the short ride back to March Place. On the other side, set into the wall behind her, was the narrow wooden portal that opened into the garden. She took a deep breath, then turned 
and opened the garden door. It was late. The sun was beginning to sink, the garden painted with a mix of long shadows and splashes of deep golden light. The shrubs and trees that had been blanketed in winter stillness a few weeks before were now budding, sending up bright green tufts of new leaves. White and purple crocuses decorated the lawn, mingling with the verdant shoots of daffodils and red-tipped tulips. There was a chill in the air, the last lingering bite of the season. Strangford sat around the corner of a tall privet hedge. His hair looked longer, as though it had grown in the week since Lily had last seen him. It brushed at the collar of his dark wool coat. His gloves were folded neatly beside him, and his bare fingers brushed over the soft, barely budded leaves of an elegant Japanese maple. He spoke without looking up. Sometimes I just need to feel something other than the inside of my gloves. Something safe, Lily offered, crossing the lawn to stand by the bench. He paused, his hand going still. Nothing's entirely safe. She sat down beside him. What do they feel like? She asked. He considered. A soft distance settled into his expression. The look she now recognized meant that his mind had gone somewhere else, running down his arm and through his fingertips into whatever he was touching. Fresh. A little surprised. As though they never expected to be here. His mouth twitched, a quick hint of a smile breaking through. And she was struck, deeply and undeniably, by how much she had come to love him. There was so much she had yet to know about him. After only a few weeks, how could there not be? It didn't matter. She loved him, loved his kindness and his vulnerability, his loyalty and that remarkable sense of joy that stubbornly refused to give up, even in the face of unimaginable horror. She had come so close to losing him. The pain of that was still sharp, tied up in the memory of what it had felt like to watch the roof of that burning warehouse come down. Even now, in the peace and calm of the garden, she could still see the raw red scar on his cheek, a visible reminder of how near he had come to death, and it set her pulse racing. She didn't care any more what the world thought, or of the artificial boundaries set by the vast difference in the circumstances of their birth. Running from her mother's history had only ever been an excuse, a way of keeping herself safe. But Strangford was right. Nothing was ever really safe. If she waited for safety before reaching out for the chance of joy, she would be waiting forever. Yet so much had changed. It's usually just one eye they ask for. You gave them four. She stood, moving away, crossing to the budding branches of a dogwood tree. I'm sorry that I didn't come sooner. I just... The words failed her leaving her throat dry. You don't have to explain. She brushed her own fingers over the newly sprouting leaves. They were soft, kissed with the fading warmth of the sun. I never had a chance to tell you. When you fell back in the warehouse, she struggled for the words. How glad I am that you got out, that you left before... Behind her, he stood. Is that what you thought? He said. That I left. She turned to face him. You must have. I saw that roof come down. Nothing could have survived inside that. Nothing. It was the oddest feeling, he said, looking down at the bare skin of his hands. I'd taken the gloves off. They were wet. I was afraid they'd slip on the ladder as I was climbing. And there was this... humming. 
in the wood, the bones of the building crying out before they gave way. I felt it, and I just... let go. Fell back down into the water, and then swam as far as I could before I came back up for air. I made it all the way back out into the dock. Looked up, and saw what had happened, and... Damn it, Lily. I couldn't know if you had managed to get out, or if you were still inside, and there was nothing I could do but float out there and watch. Have you any idea what that feels like? Yes, she replied. He raised his head and met her gaze. Only a brief stretch of green, rich garden separating them. Swallows fluttered through the branches overhead, the quick twitter of their calls dancing through the stillness of the falling afternoon. It was peaceful. And yet, Lily felt the tension stretched between them so thick and real, it seemed to vibrate in the air. Lily, he began. She cut him off. No, please, let me say this before I get too frightened and bury it all again. I have made a great many mistakes over the last few weeks. Over my life. But the ones tearing me apart are those I made with you. I am sorry that I pushed you away. That I locked you out of this and threw you all those pale excuses when you had the gall to ask why. Because the real answer is that I was terrified of how much you were coming to mean to me. And the only thing I have ever known to do when someone gets close to me is to run away. But I will not run from this any longer. Whatever it is, whatever it leads to, I am done running from it. She stopped letting the echo of those quickly falling words fade. Her heart pounded, as though it really were preparing her to turn and bolt out of the garden, just run out into the street and keep going. But she didn't run. She stayed and let the fear pound through her, refusing to grant it control. It can't be easy, he warned his own voice less than perfectly steady. What kind of relationship can thrive, with one side always knowing more than they should? Not a level playing field, Lily said quietly, echoing the words she'd used back on that windswept clearing and feeling the quick pain of them strike through her. He stepped forward, closing the distance between them. Not a level playing field, he confirmed. But God help me, Lily. I want you anyway. He caught himself, reining in some powerful impulse. The tension simmered in him, and Lily felt it echoed in her own body. A sparking, wild thing. It is damnably selfish of me, he continued his voice hoarse, moving closer. And if you choose to leave this garden right now, I will never think less of you for it. What I think, Lily said slowly, meeting his gaze, is that you should touch me. The tension snapped. He raised a hand, fingers trembling, and after drawing in a quick, full breath, brushed it across her cheek. The sensation of it singed electric across her skin, setting her whole body tingling with awareness. His fingers slid into her hair, the fullness of his palm coming to rest against the bare skin of her neck. Oh. He breathed, his pupils dilating, gaze shifting inward. And then he laughed, an explosion of pure delight. Lily felt it echoing inside of her, spilling out into the light of the garden. May I kiss you now? He asked, 
his eyes clear, present, locked onto her own. Yes, she replied. And he did. They came together, and the colours became brighter, wilder, like to one of the canvases of his gallery, a place beyond past or future. A thousand undreamed possibilities opened before them. And Lily knew that she had come home. We hope you have enjoyed our presentation of The Fire in the Glass, The London Charismatics, Book One. Written by Jacqueline Benson. Performed by Alex Picard. Produced by Audiobook Empire. Performance copyright 2022 by Jacqueline Benson. All rights reserved. For more information about this program, or other Audiobook Empire titles, please visit our website at www.audiobookempire.com. No part of this recording may be played for an audience or reproduced in any form. It may not be streamed, downloaded, broadcast, or copied without written permission.